What a pleasure to see such a nice, uh, distinguished, and obviously very enthusiastic crowd here today. Uh, we're most of us from Chicago, but we also have some visitors from afar. Um, what we all have in common, though, is a deep care for our schools and our city. Uh, I want to start with a small housekeeping remark. You notice up here we have a uh, hashtag for this event. We have Twitter handles for the sponsors, the Joyce Foundation and the Spencer Foundation. And I would um, welcome your tweeting today. So our two foundations, Joyce and Spencer, have been uh, working very closely together, planning and organizing this event. Uh, in, in re in, in, and in recognition of the importance and the priority that we place on this event, both of our presidents are here. Uh, first to welcome us, and <laughs> first to welcome us, and then to participate as the day goes on. Uh, many of you know Ellen Alberding, who's a longtime president of the Joyce Foundation, who's uh, deeply involved in important civic affairs here in Chicago, across the region, and the nation. Uh, Ellen is deeply committed to our community and its schools here in Chicago. Fewer of you know Naila Nasir, the new president of the Spencer Foundation and my new boss. Uh, Naila joined us this summer and is still learning about Chicago. Uh, she comes to us from the University of California at Berkeley, where she was most currently vice chancellor of equity and inclusion. Ellen and Naila, I turn this over to you. Thank you, John. Thank you, Naila. Welcome to Chicago. Um, already we have a wonderful partnership. I think the first time we met, I was pitching this event, and Naila was like nodding, mm, okay, maybe. Um, but here we are, and I think it's really an important moment um, for all of us. I want to just acknowledge um, that the people in this room have been at this um, work of improving student outcomes for such, such a long time. Um, I particularly want to give a shout out to my own team at the Joyce Foundation, about 20 of whom are, are here. Um, but uh, Stephanie Banchero was one of the organizers of this event. Where's Stephanie? There's Stephanie in the back. Stephanie's had you know, a really diverse role in focusing on um, improving uh, educational outcomes for low-income students. She has a personal, personal passion for it. She's covered it in, uh, in the media, most recently at the Wall Street Journal, and she's become a really important force at the foundation and nationally as well, so I really want to thank her for that. Jason Chiara is not here yet, but he will be. I th or he's out of town. Uh, Beth Swanson, all of you know, has been a force in this issue as well. Um, so thank you very much to them. I also want to acknowledge Gretchen Crosby Sims, who's here today, and she really uh, shaped the Joyce Foundation's work on education policy for a long time and was a fabulous partner to me. So welcome back, Gretchen, and lo look forward to having you, having you here. And, and finally, I, I, I want to thank Peter Cunningham for having come to us with this idea. Um, it really was um, an egg that he hatched, and uh, it, we really appreciate the idea, and I hope we're going to execute to your expectations. Um, then finally, I just want to say that um, I, I ran into uh, Rebecca just now. And Rebecca was talking about work she was doing on EL learners. And she said, it's just amazing, like all the work that we have done over these years, and now these students are showing great results. And to me, that's the, that's the kernel of what all of us are here to talk about today, which is we've done this work. We didn't know if it was going to work. It took a long time to come to fruition, and now we're seeing results. And the, the point of today is to figure out, like, what are the, those little um, investments that each of us has made that's contributed to good outcomes um, for our CPS students? So thanks for giving me that idea, Rebecca, as a particular example. Um, but I know there are many, many others in the room. So glad to be here, glad to support this, and look forward to learning a lot today. <clears throat> 
Good morning. I'm also really, really glad to be here um, and excited about today's event. And as we listen to the findings and the respondents and the conversation today, I think we need to hold two things kind of um, with equal weight and seriousness, right? On the one hand, and, and these two things operate a little bit in tension with one another. So on the, on the one hand, we are here to celebrate. This is a celebration, right? There has been, as, as Ellen mentioned, many, many years of really hard, concerted, collaborative effort to create the kind of changes that we'll hear about today. Um, and there's clearly good work happening in classrooms, in principal training, in partnerships between scholars and educators, and, and this good work is making a difference. On the other hand, I've been struck as a newcomer to Chicago at, at, at what I can only call widespread disdain for Chicago public schools. I got into the conversation about this very topic with my Lyft driver last night, who he asked me what I did. I said, oh, I you know, run a foundation that funds education research. What does that mean? And I talked about today's event. And he just flippantly said, oh, I don't believe that. <laughs> like just, and so, and, and that's a reaction I've heard again and again and again. So I think there are some skeptics about whether or not CPS is meeting the needs of the most vulnerable students in the city. Um, and I think as Sean will present in a moment, it's unequivocal that the data do show that there is major improvement on a number of fronts and that we're seeing faster gains here than elsewhere in the country. And, and I think so we both have to laud progress and recognize that there's still a long way to go a long way to go in terms of ensuring that students and families are finding themselves in schools where their potential is fully developed, and a long way to go in terms of sharing the message with the community that this improvement is happening. But real change happens slowly over time, and, um, and I'm looking forward to hearing more about both the changes and what we figured out about why they're happening. So thank you and welcome. Uh, thank you both, Ellen and Naila. That was great. Uh, we're going to move right into the first session with three presentations from uh, these three highly respected researchers. We're going to hear the presentations sequentially and save questions till the end. Uh, Paul Zabakowski down at the, my left uh, will speak first. Paul's a leadership coach and assessment specialist at the University of Illinois at Chicago. Uh, he's been digging into state uh, test scores for well over 10 years, written several reports about them. I would guess that Paul knows more about the details and the secrets of our state testing system than anyone else. Uh, and Paul is also a former Chicago Public School principal. Sean Reardon is going to speak next. Sean is the endowed professor of poverty and inequality at Stanford University. He's a prodigious and influential scholar of educational inequality. Uh, he's going to talk about this enormous database that he has built. This database is a, a feat of wonder in itself that, that Sean tenaciously pried out of the jaws of the US Department of Education. <laughs> uh, Several years ago, um, Sean very generously uh, spent a year as senior advisor to the director of the Institute of Education Sciences. Uh, to Sean's left is uh, Elaine Allensworth, uh, who is the Lewis Sebring director of the University of Chicago Consortium on School Research. Uh, by my possibly flawed count, she's been at the consortium for about 18 years. Uh, good, she, a wonderful researcher herself. Uh, I would wager that Elaine knows more about statistics, their trends, and research in general uh, about Chicago public schools than anyone on the planet. So I turn this over to Paul. Thank you, John. I'm not sure if it's a compliment to know a lot about the secrets of standardized tests, but I'll take it, you know, from a guy who knows, you know. Um, okay, well, good morning, everybody. Uh, in a moment or two, I'll be uh, sharing some evidence for my candidates for two big drivers of structural, uh, two big structural drivers of achievement uh, gains in Chicago. 
Um, but before I do that, I want to set it up a little bit with uh, a little context. So this slide that you're looking at right here is a, shows you uh, the, the progression of uh, scores on the fourth grade NAEP, the National Assessment of Educational Progress, from 2000. I'm sorry. Thank you. From 2003. Get all excited about my data, you know? Thank you, Steve. <laughs> my boss is all excited about me not communicating well. So, yeah. So, <laughs> so what you're looking at here are these NAEP scores and the four lines that you see there. Uh, that gray line uh, right here is uh, all U.S. public schools. The red line is all big city schools that participate in the TUDA NAEP portion of NAEP. The green line is all Illinois schools, and important to know there, it's all Illinois schools, including Chicago. So for most of the time that's shown here, that's about 20% about of what you see happening in Illinois is Chicago, now down to about 17%, but at any rate, a big hunk of those scores. And then that, those two beautiful blue lines are Chicago uh, public schools. Um, the, Group on the left are students eligible for free and reduced lunch. The group uh, on the right are students not eligible for free and reduced lunch. So one other piece of context here, something I like to characterize as an urban myth, something I hear a lot about, so I wanted to get it out there right on the front end, which is I, what I hear a lot from folks is that uh, a major driver of uh, achievement change in Chicago is probably mostly just about changes in student demographics gentrification in the city, uh, shifts in uh, population. So I wanted to show you what some of those major changes have been uh, and give you a little bit of evidence that, that is, pretty, for me, pretty compelling that that's a contributor but not a major driver. So what you're looking at right now uh, is a chart that shows pretty much constant free and reduced lunch uh, count in Chicago, about around 85% during the entire NCLB period from 2001 all the way through uh, 2016. You also see slightly declining mobility here with this green, pretty stable white, popula uh, white test population, pretty stable Asian population, and then two big shifts uh, in two populations that are driving people's thoughts that maybe it's changes in demographics that are driving achievement changes. And that is big decline in, in, in uh, black students uh, and a big rise in Latino students. And so the piece that makes people feel like maybe that's what's driving changes is that when you look at all students in grades 3-8 uh, who are not uh, temporarily designated as English language learners, there are big differences in achievement. On average, black students are achieving, at about 30% of those students are achieving at or above the state median, while uh, on average Latino students, about 42% are achieving at or above the statewide median. So big difference. The thing that people are not taking into consideration when they think about uh, when they make this attribution, is that a large portion of the Latino students who replace black students in the testing pool are in fact des temporarily designated as English language learners. And when you uh, take, a, and on average, those scores were about the same or a little lower than black students they replaced until those students move out of that uh, ELL designation and, um, and, and, uh, and, and are no longer uh, getting those kinds of services. So to test what the actual contribution was, don't want to get too geeky on you here, but this is useful data, I hope. Um, we took a look at the actual scores in 2016 and compared them with actual scores in 21. And when I say scores, I'm talking about percentage of students who are scoring at or above the statewide median. It's a common metric we can use across tests. And what we saw there when we looked at actual scores, when the distribution in 2016 was 39% black and 46% Latino, was there was a 23 uh, point change between 2001 and 2016 in third grade, 12 points in fifth grade, 13 points in eighth grade. So then what we did was we used a little simple math to say, okay, let's do a what if analysis here. Let's take the average. Let's take all the. Let's take the average black and Latino scores in 2016, and then let's shift the proportions of the test population around so that, the, so that those proportions look the same as they did in 2001. That is 52% black um, and 35% Latino. And what we saw was that the changes were just slightly. That, that the gains were just slightly lower, between one and three points lower. So yes, a contribution, but not a really substantial contribution. Okay, so that takes me now to my two candidates, there are many, my two candidates for big structural contributors to achievement change in Chicago. The first one, uh, John and Stuart Lopescu and Todd Rosencrantz wrote about way back in 2006 when the first shift of ISATS uh, uh, tests took place and 
What these guys looked at at that time, a couple of years before John went over and worked for the Obama administration at IES, was they took a look at four different ethnic populations um, at, at, at white kids, black kids, Latino kids, and Asian kids to see what scores looked like when you compared Chicago scores with st scores of all the kids in the rest of the state, excluding Chicago. And one of the things that they found was that, those, that the gaps between those two populations tended to decrease quite a bit. Uh, many of you may be familiar with this data. tended to decrease quite a bit in the middle school grades, in grades six through eight. Much smaller differences uh, in upper grades uh, than in lower grades in the 3A population. So we took a look at that. One thing that John and his colleagues were not able to do in 2006 was they, they, they could only take one snapshot because they didn't have a longitudinal sample to work with. We now have had the occasion to be able to look at four cohorts where we're tracking kids all the way from third grade all the way through eighth grade. And that makes a big difference because it allows, it tells us when some interesting shifts are taking place. This particular cohort that's up on the screen here is the eighth grade graduating class of 2014. And what you're seeing over here on the right are those same students when they're in third grade moving all the way through eighth grade. So the same kids over, over a uh, six year period from third grade through eighth grade. The thing to notice in this particular chart, the blue lines are white kids, the purple lines are black kids, and the tan lines are Latino youngsters, is that, and this line right here means zero difference, right? So there's no difference at all at zero. So in grades three through five, for black and Latino kids, the, big, the bulk of the Chicago population slightly under what their counterparts in the rest of Illinois are doing. But then take a look at this big jump starting at grade six through, at grade six through eight. One might assume without looking at this, these cohorts carefully that that means there's a huge acceleration in achievement in middle schools in Chicago. Not so. What's actually happening is a big depression of achievement in, middle schools, in the middle school populations and all the rest of the state where kids transition from a K-5 school to a 6-8 school. And that transition has a huge impact on student achievement, and we've got plenty of national data to support it. One of the things that just is very, well, very much underappreciated, I think, <laughs> certainly downstate where uh, most of these middle schools are, uh, is that the impact of that transition alone, the disruptive impact of that transition, is huge on student achievement. Chicago benefits from not having, from not having that disruption. So that's, one, that's my one candidate. Another one. Um, which is even larger, is really big, big gains in school effectiveness with students in grades PK through four. So what's the evidence for that? Well, these are NAEP scores, NAEP, fourth grade NAEP math scores that you're looking at right here. And I'm focusing on this slide just on students in the 25th percentile. That is the lowest achieving, uh, core, the, low, the kids, at the average scores of youngsters at the bottom end of Chicago's achievement distribution. The average scale scores for that group between 2001, or 2003 and 2015 on the fourth grade math, NAEP. And you can see, here's all Illinois in green, which includes Chicago, and Chicago in blue. And you can imagine here, because you're seeing flattening, actually a little decline, that if you took Chicago out of the mix, you'd be seeing a much more precipitous decline in uh, all Illinois, right, or the rest of Illinois. So this is important because we spend a lot of time and attention looking at what happens with our lowest achieving population. But then look at what happens at the middle of the distribution, an even bigger jump, an even steeper rise in youngsters who are in the middle of the achievement distribution. And then at the top, an even bigger jump. So the entire distribution of scoring in fourth grade math has moved not up, not just the youngsters who are, remedi who are receiving remedial and supplemental support. That's a very important thing to know because you just don't move youngsters <clears throat> who are in lower achieving categories without moving the full distribution. Something that's quite different than where an awful lot of policy is aimed. Okay, so breaking this information down, we're just about done here. Uh, breaking this information down by racial and ethnic, uh, by racial groups and by family income groups, what you're looking at here are students in Chicago who are eligible for free and reduced lunch. These are non-ELL third graders who are scoring at or above uh, Illinois medians. So here you are in 2001, and you can see the, the three different groups represented. That's Chicago. And then all the way up in 2016, big continuous jump with one exception, with one exception, which is low-income black students in Chicago have not benefited in the same way that other populations have benefited from the, drive, from the huge rise in student achievement that's occurring in the city. Take a look now at the rest of Illinois. Same, pop, same counterparts, but here's what their growth trajectory looks like. And you can see that, whoops, you can see that um, 
well, it's nothing, it's no great, it's not something we uh, want to take great satisfaction in. When you look at that same group of uh, students coming from low-income uh, black families um, uh, outside of the city, that, those numbers have actually declined pretty substantially between 2008 um, and 2016. So here's the same group of students not eligible for free and reduced lunch. You can see the same basic patterns with the exception that the black population there is now following the same growth trajectory as the rest of the population. And the net effect of these declines in the rest of Illinois and these huge increases in Chicago yields this. In 2001, 3% of all districts in central and southern Illinois scored about the same or lower than Chicago on, a state, on statewide math exams. In 2016, 51% of all districts and 74% of all K-12 large unit districts in central and southern Illinois scored about the same or lower than Chicago on statewide math exams. A really dramatic shift in the center of gravity of achievement in this state. So it's the end of my time. I've got lots more to, I have lots more to say about it. If you're interested in pursuing this a little further, here are a couple reports that are available on our websites for all of you to jump into and be really eager to read. Thanks very much. Good morning. When I was talking to, uh, to John Easton and Peter Cunningham earlier this summer about coming, I was actually really excited about coming to this event, mostly for the next panel, because uh, I've noticed in the data that I'm going to show you now that there seem to be uh, remarkable improvements, and, and Paul's data shows you that too, uh, in Chicago Public Schools test scores, um, but I don't know why. And my data that I'll show you today don't tell us why. So what I'm actually really excited about is the, is the next panel uh, that hopefully will, will help us learn why as, as Paul started to, to get to. So what I'm going to do is more show you uh, the data that I have that compares Chicago public schools test scores to those of every other public school system in the United States. So for the last few years, I've been working on building a data set that uh, includes about 300 million standardized test scores. It's the, it's the grade three to eight test scores of every child in public school in the United States from 2009 to 2015. Um, and using those data, we've then been able to equate the test scores in school districts uh, across the United States, equate them across time, and equate them across grades. And what that lets us do is say, how are Chicago students doing compared not just to other students in Illinois, but how are they doing compared to the national average? How are they changing over time relative to the national average? How much do students' scores improve from third to eighth grade within a cohort of students in Chicago? How does that compare to the national average? So by, by sort of uh, assembling this, we can learn a lot about outliers. Hello? Good morning. OK, so I woke, woke myself up. All right, so let me, let me show you some data. Um, so this is uh, a picture of the test scores in every school district in the United States, about 11,500 dots on there. Each one is a school district. Uh, and on the horizontal axis, we've put a measure of the average socioeconomic conditions of the families whose children attend public schools in those districts. So this is a composite measure of things like parents' income, parents' education level, uh, SNAP eligibility rates, poverty rates, unemployment rates, and uh, the percentage of kids who are in female-headed households. So we take all those things, put them into a big composite. Zero is the national average. So if you're a school district that's a zero here, that means you sort of have the average socioeconomic conditions of, of any school district in the US. And to the right is richer and more highly educated, and to the left is poorer and less highly educated. On the vertical axis is this sort of equated measure of standardized test scores in each school district. And what we've done is standardized the scores so they're relevant to the national average. So zero here means that students in that district in a given grade have average test scores that are equal to the national average for that grade. And then we've scaled it in grade level. So one means your students are scoring on average one grade level higher than the national average for their grade and so on. So what you can see here is uh, in a very, um, a very strong relationship between the socioeconomic backgrounds of children in a school district and their average test scores in third grade. 
Uh, in the most affluent districts in the United States, in third grade, children are scoring more than two grade levels uh, above the national average. And in the poorest districts, they're scoring more than two grade levels below the national average. And that's a very strong correlation. There's very few affluent places with low test scores in third grade and very few poor places with high test scores in third grade. Um, so this is what it looks like in third grade. If we look at the 100 largest school districts in the United States, these are the 100 largest districts. They're, they're scaled to size here. So uh, that's New York, Los Angeles, and this is Chicago. Uh, so this is in third grade. Uh, in Chicago, and you can see that in third grade, test scores in Chicago are rather low relative to the national average and rather low relative to other large school districts. Um, now, remember, not all these large school districts are, are lower income. That is, there are some very high income large school districts, some of the big county districts in northern Virginia, for example. So a large district doesn't mean a poor district. But even comparing Chicago to some of the other similarly poor districts, Chicago's third grade scores aren't great. But if we follow children in a, within a cohort from third to fourth grade and so on, this is what we see. So here's fourth grade, fifth grade, sixth grade, seventh grade, eighth grade. So you'll notice here that a couple things happen in that picture. The, the graph gets sort of steeper. That is, on average, scores in rich districts go up and scores in poorer districts go a little bit down as kids progress through school. And that's true of the large districts as well, but it's not true of Chicago. Chicago moves from being relatively low performing, even among similar school districts, to having test scores that are much closer to the national average. They, that is, they go up by about a grade level across the five years from third to eighth grade. So much faster growth rates of test scores from third to eighth grade in Chicago than, in fact, in any other large school district. The growth rate from third to eighth grade in Chicago is the fastest among the 100 large districts in the United States. It is number one. Uh, and on average, students... <laughs> on average, students in Chicago gain six years of achievement on this scale in the five years from third to eighth grade. That is, their learning rates are about 20% faster than the national average not just for large districts, but the national average for all kids in the country. So that's a remarkably fast, that's like getting an extra year of schooling squeezed in somehow between third and eighth grade. Um, if we compare Chicago to other, schools, uh, other school districts in Illinois, you might say, well, maybe this is just an Illinois thing. Maybe Illinois scores are all sort of going up a lot. I think Paul already told us that's not true, but I'll, I'll show you it again. So if we, if we watch the same animation now, this is obviously Chicago's the big one there, right? Uh, uh, and so this is third grade scores in all the school districts in Chicago. Fourth grade, fifth grade, sixth grade, seventh grade, eighth grade. The other similarly socioeconomically disadvantaged communities in, Chicago, in Illinois are seeing their test scores sort of decline as kids progress through from third to eighth grade. That is, kids are making slower than average progress. But in Chicago, sort of starts out looking kind of low and ends up looking very good. So there's a lot of progress from third to eighth grade uh, in Chicago public schools. If we look at it a different way, uh, now, now I've got grade, grades on the horizontal axis and again, um, uh, this sort of national equivalent scale. In third grade, this is the cohort of students who were in third grade in 2008-2009. They would have been in eighth grade in 2013-14, and they should be high school seniors this year. They're the graduating class of this year. So think of this as the kids who are scheduled to graduate uh, this next spring. So in third grade, this cohort had test scores that are about a grade and a half below the national average for third graders. But by eighth grade, this cohort had test scores that are about 0.4 grade levels below the national average. That is, in both math and, and reading, they catch up by about a grade level. When we look at it by, by race uh, and ethnicity, now the, we see the same pattern for all the racial and ethnic groups. The, the bottom blue lines are black, uh, the purple lines are Latino, uh, the white and the green are, are whites and Asians, and all four of those groups see faster than average growth rates 
uh, in all cases, about 20% faster than the national average. Not just 20% faster than the national average for that group, but 20% faster than the national average for all students. That is, this, this rapid growth rate from third to eighth grade is shared equally uh, across racial and ethnic groups. It's not concentrated in one group. Now, it's actually a little bit faster for Hispanics than in the other group. Um, and so the Hispanic white gap in eighth grade is smaller than the Hispanic white gap in third grade. The black-white gap is about the same size in eighth grade as third grade because while both groups are making faster than average progress, uh, they're making equally faster than average progress. So the gap isn't narrowing. So on the one hand, I think this is excellent news. And that is to say that the growth is, is shared widely and broadly across the population of students. But it also points out there's still, uh, there's a large achievement gap um, in third grade and for the most part, that large achievement gap persists through eighth grade. Now, it, uh, it's not getting worse. We're, and in fact, in many school districts, those gaps actually get wider by eighth grade. So it's, it's sort of better than average in that sense. But there's clearly, as Nayula said at the beginning, still a long way to go in terms of, of equity, uh, despite the fact that there's been lots of, lots of progress. The other dimension um, in which it's, I think, important to think about is, is this is the this is the achievement gains of a given cohort of students as they progress from third to eighth grade. But what happens if we look at the achievement growth across cohorts? So if we look at third graders one year, third graders the next year, third graders the next year, what kind of progress do we see? And here I'm just gonna show you third, fifth, and seventh grade so the picture isn't too cluttered, but the patterns are the same for, for the even grades as well. Uh, but you can see that in 2009, third grade scores in Chicago are, as I showed you before, about a grade and a half lower than the national average. By 2014, third graders have gained, improved their scores by about two thirds of a grade level. So they're only about uh, three quarters of a grade level below the national average in 2014. That same improvement is evident in fifth grade and evident in seventh grade and evident in all the, evident in all the other grades. So that says two things are happening in Chicago. Within a given cohort of kids, growth rates are faster than they are at the national average by about 20% faster than the av national average. And across cohorts, one cohort gets to third grade with higher scores than the previous cohort did and sustains that, those improvements all the way through eighth grade. Um, so there's sort of two dimensions of improvement that I think are worth pointing out, the growth across cohorts and growth within cohorts across grades. Now, I first, you know, we've been playing with this data for a long time, and I first noticed Chicago sort of stood out as a big outlier um, a while ago, and my immediate reaction was, like Nihilus Lyft driver, uh, to be a little suspicious, right? Um, uh, for example, Atlanta in 2009 is a, stands out as a big outlier in our data, too. Looks, looks great. But... Turns out they were cheating. Uh, uh, there's lots of ways that test scores might not reflect kids' actual learning, cheating being one of them, but that's not the only way. There may be sort of increasing familiarity with the tests as time goes on. There may be in increasing teaching to the test. There may be uh, various ways in which the test scores are inflated or increasingly inflated measures of kids' achievement, the real achievement, and what we care about is, of course, their real achievement. But one way we can test this is we can look at another test, the NAEP test, which doesn't have lots of the concerns that the, that the ISAT test or other state standardized tests have. The NAEP is given every two years to a representative sample of fourth and eighth graders in Chicago, uh, and it has no stakes attached to it. Those scores are never reported at the individual or the school level. So if a school has high or low NAEP scores, nobody would ever know. So it doesn't have the same, there's no accountability pressure attached to it. So it doesn't have the same kind of incentives for someone to say, well, let's try to focus our instruction on this particular test because why would you, the NAEP doesn't matter. But the other nice thing about the NAEP is it's the same test over time. So the scores are comparable from one uh, administration to the next. The scores are, are on the same scale in fourth and eighth grade so we can measure growth. And the NAEP test is given not only to nationally representative samples, but there's representative samples of students in 20 other large urban school districts. Um, and so we can compare NAEP scores in Chicago to NAEP scores in other large urban districts and to the nation as a whole. And we don't have to worry that the NAEP test is 
affected by things like teaching to the test, test familiarity, or cheating, right? So when we look at the NAEP data for Chicago, this is what we see. On the horizontal axis, I have fourth and eighth grade. It's only tested in those two grades. The vertical axis is the NAEP test scale. The light gray dashed line is the national average NAEP scores in fourth and eighth grade. Uh, and this is the cohort of kids who were in fourth grade in 2010-11 and eighth grade in 2014-15. So com a comparable time period to the data I'm showing you from the ISAT. The, the white dashed line is the average among the lar 20 large urban districts that TUDA is administered to. Uh, and those districts have lower than average national average NAEP scores, and they have growth rates that are about the same as the national average from fourth to eighth grade. Chicago is in blue, and Chicago's test scores are similar in fourth grade uh, in this cohort to other larger urban districts, but much higher in eighth grade than other large urban districts. That difference in growth rates is about 20%, which is exactly what we see in the ISAT data. That is, scores go up on NAEP up 20% faster than the national average from fourth to eighth grade, just as they go up 20% faster than the national average on the ISAT score from fourth to eighth grade. And since the NAEP is not a test that has any incentive to, to cheat or teach, teach to the test, that suggests that what we see in the ISAT re represents real learning gains over, that, over those grades, not uh, an artifact of uh, test preparation or anything like that. Likewise, if we look at the NAEP scores over time, so now this is NAEP scores in Chicago and the national average from 2003 to 2015. In, in every grade, and particularly in math and fourth grade reading, test scores on NAEP have gone up faster than the national average, and particularly in the years since about 2009 or so. That is the same growth across cohorts that we see in the ISAT data, and that Paul showed you as well. We see it in the NAEP data for Chicago. So both of those things suggest that the changes aren't driven by, um, by an artifact of the high stakes nature of the test sort of distorting the test. That is to say, there's no evidence that th these improvements are driven by cheating, teaching to the test, test prep, any of those sorts of things. This seems to me like it's a real thing. This isn't Atlanta, I think is, right? All right. Uh, so the last thing you might wonder is, is, is this driven by things like uh, changing demographics, changing population of the school system, or grade retention? One way to give every kid six years to learn between third and eighth grade would be to retain every kid for one year along the way, right? And then they actually would have six years to learn. Uh, we, we looked at the publicly available grade retention data, and it looks from my sort of rough reading of the grade retention data that, online, that about 14% of students in Chicago public schools are retained once, sometime between third and eighth grade. Nationally, about 9% of kids are retained once between third and eighth grade. So while the retention rate's slightly higher in Chicago than it is nationally, it's only five percentage points higher. And there's no way that 5% of kids drives a 20% increase. Those 5% of kids would have to be learning an astronomical amount in that extra year for that to account for this enormous improvement. That is, that it probably at most counts for about 1 of the of the Im improvement we see in Chicago. So I don't think grade retention uh, is a likely candidate for this at all. Likewise, changing demographics are probably implausible, partly because demographics don't change enough to drive a a change this fast, partly because, as Paul said, the scores of Hispanic and black students both are roughly similar over this time period, and test scores are going up from third to eighth grade and across cohorts for, for all the racial and ethnic groups. If it were a demographic change, we might expect to see real that, that, that there were differences in the difference groups, so substituting one population group for another population group would be driving the change. But none of the data suggests that that's a plausible explanation, and so what I think that leaves us with, um, sort of by process of eliminating other explanations, is that the data reflect real improvements in the academic skills of Chicago public school systems, both across cohorts and rapid rates of learning, much rap more rapid than the national average, from third to eighth grade. Um, and, and as you know, the principle of Occam's razor says, pick the least complicated explanation for something. Uh, 
And the least complicated explanation at this point seems to me that, that it, the, this reflects something real and that's going on. And the question that I've been thinking about for a year, and I'm hoping the next panel is going to help answer, is uh, what's driving this? What's Chicago doing right? Is it something that's happening in the early elementary grades? Is it something happening in the middle school? Is it something in preschool? What's going on that's driving these, these uh, remarkable improvements? Okay. So I do want to you know, acknowledge, uh, before I go any further, that Chicago has a lot of challenges, a lot of the same challenges that we see in a lot of other urban districts, challenges that come with having um, areas of the city with concentrated poverty, um, high levels of racial segregation, um, gun violence. Um, these are challenges that, of course, affect students, they affect families, they affect schools. Um, and as humans, we naturally focus on all these challenges because we're really concerned about them, right? But as we focus on all of the challenges and the problems in the districts, in the district, it can be easy to lose sight of actually what's working. And then when we hear about things that are working, we can't process it because we have this narrative in our heads. But the fact is, Sean and Paul just showed you that elementary test scores have been increasing dramatically in Chicago, so something is going right. And I'm going to tell you there's a lot more that's going right than that. So 10 years ago, back in 2006, even students who came to high school with really strong test scores were at risk of failing classes in ninth grade. In fact, in 2006, only 61% of students who entered CPS high schools were on track to graduate at the end of their ninth grade year. That means that almost 40% of students failed at least two semesters of a core course, so they didn't have the credits they needed to be likely to graduate on time. 10 years later, in 2016, 88 percent of students who start in CPS high schools are on track to graduate at the end of their ninth grade year. That's a 27 percentage point increase. Now, freshman on track is the leading indicator of high school graduation rates. Um, so, and what we've been seeing in Chicago is that as freshman on track rates have been increasing, high school graduation rates have been following four years later, right? Because students need four years to get through high school. But that means still, within the last 10 years, we've seen a 17 percentage point increase in high school graduation rates. And these improvements actually have largely occurred, they've really been driven by non-charter, non-selective schools. So a lot of the neighborhood schools in Chicago have seen dramatic increases in their high school graduation rates. Now, graduation rates, high school graduation rates, have been improving all across the country, but we've seen bigger gains in Chicago than we've seen in the rest of the country. And the improvements have not always been equitable. When they first started increasing, we first started seeing improving graduation rates um, among white and Asian students, and we started seeing gaps growing, even though rates were increasing. But in the most recent years, the groups that have made the largest improvements in high school graduation rates are African American and Latino young men. Right? And so we've seen, and they started out with the lowest graduation rates. So we've seen equity improving over time, as well as the rates for all students improving over time. Now, another change that people a lot of times don't recognize if they just look at the graduation rates is that the characteristics of both graduates and non-graduates have changed over time. I'm going to talk about the achievement level of graduates in just a minute, but what you may not realize is that non-graduates are not a monolithic group. Back in 2006, the vast majority of non-graduates were students who had left school dropouts, right? In 2015, half of the students we count as non-graduates are students who are either still in school, so they're like fifth year seniors who may still get a diploma, or they're students who didn't get a CPS diploma, but got a diploma from an alternative school, that's a school that may um, 
that follow state graduation requirements but may not follow city graduation requirements or they have a GED. So even non-graduates are leaving um, with higher credentials than in the past. Okay, I'm returning again to this figure on graduation rates. You know, sometimes people worry that if graduation rates are going up, the quality of the diploma will go down, right? Um, so let's look at what's happening with graduates after they leave CPS high schools. Are we seeing that they're less likely to enroll in college than graduates in previous years? Um, actually, CPS graduates are more likely than ever to enroll in college. Uh, we've seen a three percentage point increase in the percentage of high school graduates enrolling in two-year colleges and an 11 percentage point increase in the percentage of graduates enrolling in four-year colleges. So now, 44% of, in the, in the last cohort, 44% of CPS graduates enrolled in a four-year college immediately after high school. That puts the CPS four-year college enrollment rate on par with the nation. Even though Chicago is an 85% low-income district, and we know that finances play a big role in whether students enroll in college. Let's dig into that a little bit further. Okay, so because high school graduation rates have been going up, we have way more high school graduates each year um, now than we did in the past. So now I'm just focusing in, on two years of high school graduates, 2006 and 2015. And you can see in 2015, we have you know, over 4,000 more graduates than we did in 2006. And of those graduates, many more are immediately enrolling in college. So back in 2006, students were as likely not to enroll in college immediately after high school as to enroll in college. By 2015, graduates were almost twice as likely to enroll in college immediately after high school as to not enroll in college. And then because we have a larger base number of graduates in the first place, we end up having about 5,000 more students enrolling in college each year than we did 10 years ago. And on top of that, among those students who enroll in a four-year college, they're actually more likely to graduate from that four-year college than CPS graduates who enrolled in four-year colleges 10 years ago, right? So the college graduation rates of CPS students have also risen at the same time as we have more students going to college. So these are basically gains on top of gains on top of gains, right? These are all multiplicative, right? Now, you can imagine, I just said, we've had these improvements in post-secondary outcomes that the achievement level of CPS graduates has changed over time. Graduates have much higher academic achievement than in the past. So we have more graduates and they're higher achieving than ever before. Um, we have more students taking AP classes. Um, the average number of AP classes that students are taking has gone up and pass rates on AP exams have increased. We have about 5,000 more students each year making it to the end of the junior year to take the ACT or the SAT now, right, than we had in the past. More students are taking the ACT, and ACT scores are up. More students are you know, graduating with at least a 21, and average scores have increased by a point and a half, which is equivalent to a year of learning, a year in school. Okay. There is no stronger indicator of how students will do in college than their high school GPA. It used to be only a fifth of graduates had a 3.0 GPA or better. And we've seen in our research that it's really only students who are getting Bs or better, who have a 3.0 GPA or better, that have a strong likelihood of succeeding when they get to a four-year college. It used to be only a fifth, now it's a third. Now because GPAs are such an incredibly strong predictor of later outcomes, I wanna dig into them just a little bit more. Um, this figure shows the GPAs of the last 10 graduating cohorts when they were in ninth grade. The bottom orange and red are students getting D averages, the top blue and red um, 
are the students getting A's and B's? So I said at the beginning of this presentation that all students, even students with strong test scores, used to be at risk of failing classes when they got to high school. In fact, you can see about 40% of students back in 2006, 40% of freshmen had D averages or below. D average puts you at high, D average or below puts you at high risk of not graduating high school. By 2013, that had been cut in half, right? At the same time, we have way more students earning A's and B's in their ninth grade year. Um, that puts them on track to be able to succeed in college. Why has this been happening? Other people have mentioned demographic and economic changes in the district, which have happened. But like they said, we've looked at the high school level, there's absolutely no way that those changes could account for more than a tiny fraction of the improvements we've seen in the high schools. Um, in very recent years, we've seen improvements in the elementary school achievement, and that could account for some of the improvements that we've seen in the high schools in the most recent years. But the improvements that have been happening in the high school have actually started before we saw improvements in the elementary schools. And when we look at students entering high school today, um, we see that they're more likely to succeed than students with exactly the same levels of incoming achievement from the middle grades, the same backgrounds, the same economic and demographic backgrounds um, 10 years ago. So students who look the same, who have the same achievement coming in, are just much more likely to succeed in school now than they used to be, right? It looks like high schools are just doing a much better job of supporting students to do the job of high school. And in fact, students and teachers are reporting much better climates in which they're living and working and much better instruction than they did in the past. Um, you know, the district surveys students and teachers every year on the five essential school climate surveys and we haven't seen improvements in all areas, and some areas actually have gone down. But those areas that most directly touch students in terms of school climate and the quality of instruction have been going up, 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 consistently up. Some of the, the biggest improvements have been in the areas of instruction and climate. And we see corresponding reports from both students and teachers. And on top of that, Attendance has been improving, um, and you know, that could have a big part to play with the improving test scores and the improving grades, and suspension rates have been going down. Right? So we have all of these metrics about how the schools are doing, and they're all pointing in the same direction. Right? That says, you know, all of these gains, they're actually real. And they're not only real, they are really substantial. So, you know, I, we do have to acknowledge that CPS has struggled with declining enrollment, state budget impasse. We had many years of leadership turnover in the district. But at the same time, we have to acknowledge this is a district that is really innovative. It's been doing really intentional work around restorative justice, social emotional learning, freshman on track, tracking college outcomes, FAFSA completion, teacher evaluation, um, instructional improvement, common core, uh, collaboration among teachers around data within schools, learning networks of leadership, um, school leadership teams across schools and, and you know, instructional teams across schools so that schools are learning from each other, looking at each other's data. Um, this is also a school district with a dedicated network of support in the foundation community, in the nonprofit community. I mean, all of this has happened despite all of the challenges that Chicago has faced. And personally, that makes me think we have a lot of really dedicated, courageous, smart professionals in our schools, because this couldn't happen without the people in the schools doing it. Yeah. We've seen these really remarkable improvements um, in the experience of students in school, and that's making a huge difference for their lives in the city of Chicago.
but anybody got a question, burning question that they'd like to lead off with? David. I mean, that's, you know, city colleges, so I don't want to confound that with uh, CPS. I think, you know, we, you know, we want to look at what's happening in city colleges. Um, you know, there have been changes in terms of how they're, um, you know, the efforts that they're making to actually make sure that students who have, have completed their requirements get a degree. And so um, that can result in more graduates. Um, but maybe those students should have been counted as graduates before because they actually have, you know, um, done the requirements. I, I don't want to talk too much about that because there are other people who could speak to that better than, more than I could. Um, VGA has also come out with, you know, reports that criticize CPS's graduation rates over time. You know, they've noted places where um, students have been miscoded as transfers or where there's not good documentation about whether students actually transferred. And, you know, students who transfer get taken out of the graduation rate statistics. So one way of potentially making graduation rates look better is to um, code students as having transferred when they didn't really. And um, we actually looked into that to see, well, could changes in how students are being coded who leave um, explain some of these differences that we've seen in graduation rates. Um, and we found there were a couple of years between 2006 and 2008 that there were increases in the percentage of students who were transferring out of district, out of the district. But in most of the years, including the years where we saw the biggest improvements in graduation rates, transfer rates actually were down. So graduation rates were being counted out of a larger percentage of the students who initially started in CPS. So that was not driving the, improve, the overall improvements in graduation rates in Chicago. Oh, that's okay. Go ahead. Uh, our, this question comes from uh, Tom Brock, who is the commissioner of the National Center of Education Research and the acting director of the Institute of Education Sciences. Welcome, Tom. Okay, thank you, John. Uh, Elaine. You had mentioned uh, at the start that the improvements you're seeing are really driven by students in traditional public schools and not in charters or other alternatives. Oh, but I wondered no, no, if you have, could. Those schools have improved too. Okay, yeah. that was just yeah. my question because yeah. coming from Washington, there's a lot of interest in those alternatives. Could you just tell us what percentage of students roughly uh, are not in traditional public schools and what trend lines, if any, are you seeing for that other segment? Yeah, so there have been growing numbers of students not in traditional public schools. That definitely is a, a, a major trend in Chicago. I'm trying to remember offhand the percentage. 20% are not in traditional schools right now. Um, so, um, and, and that has been increasing at the same time that you know, we've seen these changes. So we've looked at those um, differences. We've looked at that in a couple of ways. We've looked at um, what has been the you know, change in graduation rates by sector. Um, and then we've also looked to see, well, could the changes in graduation rates be driven by students moving into charter schools and selective schools? Um, and so first of all, if you look by sector, you'll see that you know, just looking at neighborhood schools following the same schools over time, we see big improvements in a lot of the neighborhood schools. And, and in fact, on average, the neighborhood school graduation rates have pretty much caught up to the charter school graduation rates, which started out higher. Um, and then if we look to at the, um, you know, we've done some analyses to um, adjust for the changes in which, you know, the sector. So, you know, could we account for, to what degree could the differences in graduation rates over time be explained by the movement of more students out of neighborhood schools into charter schools and selective schools? And that can only account for a very, very small percent of the 
improvements that we've seen. Well, let's yeah. thank our research panel today. Uh, so we've been hearing these questions all along. Well, we've got these improvements. What's causing them? We've heard some speculation, some hypotheses, but now we're going to have a panel of people uh, talk in depth about this. And uh, I'm going to introduce Kate Grossman, uh, who's going to moderate this panel. Panel. Uh, Kate. Uh, top-notch journalist here in Chicago who's covered CPS for many years, first at the Chicago Sun-Times, and now she's at WBEZ, where she's the chief editor of the Education Desk. And Kate is going to welcome the panel up, and if you take your nameplates with you, and we're just going to sit in your seats. <laughs> and take... Welcome everyone and thanks to our panelists for being here and for all of you for coming to be part of this conversation. Can everyone hear me okay? Okay. Um, so we know the gains are there and they're real. We heard that many times, but as Sean said, we don't know the why, although we did hear some, some thoughts on that, which we'd like to mine with this group. Um, and that is, of course, the essential question. Why, why are we seeing gains? How much of them are real? How much of them are due to other factors? It's important for Chicago, it's important for the nation to understand what's going on here. So to answer that question, there's lots of things you can do. You can look at research, you can look at, talk to people on the ground, hear what's happening. You can, people have theories based on their own observations and on data, and that's really what I'd like this group to do, um, is to mine all those, and um, especially some of the thornier areas. So the question of this demographic shift, how much of a role, if any, does that play? Um, how much does test prep and test familiarity play? How much pressure is on teachers and principals to boost scores that may result in some gaming of the system or potentially some cheating? Um, and then there's the question of really what is happening in the classroom that's driving the NAEP scores you know, in fourth grade going way up and going up you know, significantly all the way through eighth grade. What are we seeing? What enduring innovations are we seeing in the classroom that are making a difference? Um, and what are we seeing in particular with Latino students who are helping driving, drive the change here in Chicago? What are we seeing with them that helps explain these gains? So um, to sort through this, we have this terrific panel. Um, we have Janice Jackson on the end, who I'm sure everybody knows, but um, Janice is the Chief Education Officer here at CBS. She's been in that role uh, for about two years. She was former network chief, former principal, former high school uh, social studies teacher. We have Greg Jones who is a Kenwood Academy principal. Um, that school has seen a lot of improvement over many metrics um, in recent years. And Kenwood's recognized nationally for its early college credentials, a number of scholarships earned by its students, its percent of freshmen on track, and um, its performing arts program. We have Raymond Hart, who is our national guy. <laughs> He's the director of research for the Council of the Great City Schools. He's got 25 years of experience in research and evaluation spanning a range of areas. These include post-secondary success and college readiness, school improvement, teacher effectiveness, and early childhood. Um, among his many stops in his career, he was executive director of research um, for Atlanta Public Schools. Um, we have Rebecca Vanderlack Navarro. She is from the Latino Policy Forum, the Education Policy Director. So their focus there is on uh, ensuring that Latino and English language learners can access high quality care and education services. And then we have Sarah Ray Stalinga, got it right? Okay. Um, she is the director of the University of Chicago Urban Education Institute, where she's also a clinical professor on the committee for the Committee on Education and a UFC faculty member. She leads all aspects of UEI, which includes overseeing the development of teachers, applied research, school operations, and the distributions of models to improve schools nationally. So the plan is, um, I asked all of them to give some thought to one or two main drivers that they think are propelling the gains we're seeing in Chicago. So I've asked them to give two minute, very brief, um, just your top two, one or two list um, to start, and then we'll 
have a conversation um, between the group and and I don't know if we're going to have time for questions at the end, but I'll try to sneak them in if we can. So, um, and with uh, Ray, Raymond, we're going to ask you to broaden it out a little bit since you're not a Chicago guy. Help us understand for urban school districts around the country what one or two themes you might have might see that are consistent. So, um, Janice, if you wouldn't mind kicking us off. Oh, I'm kicking us off. <laughs> <laughs> I feel like whenever I speak, then people just say exactly what I just said. No, I'm just joking. But um, I was really hoping to, to give other people an opportunity um, because there there are a lot of things that, that we believe are driving the outcomes that you see here in, in Chicago public schools. And I should also say that I'm very excited to be here today because one of the things that we, um, as a district, were look that we were looking forward to today is, number one, not only having me or Forrest or the mayor be the one to talk about the, the gangs that are happening in Chicago, but to have other folks reaffirm that message. So I, I thank Professor Reardon and others um, from UIC who are here to talk about that. But also just to, to extend an open invitation to researchers and the research community that is in the room because um, we have a lot of uh, different hypotheses around um, the changes and the improvements that we've seen in, in CPS, but I also know that it's important that that is um, undergirded by strong research and, and, and things that can be validated and more importantly replicated throughout the country. So that's really the charge today. Um, but if I had to pick two, and I've talked about this before. Um, number one, I would say we, we cannot discount the work that we've done with regard to principal quality here in the district. And I raise that because so many of the other things that we'll talk about um, from strong instructional systems, the use of data, teacher collaboration, improved uh, teacher quality in the classroom, all of those conditions are created when you have a strong leader in the building. It's also a clear fact that CPS has seen a lot of turnover at the top. Um, I don't worry too much about that, but there's a lot of turnover at the top. <laughs> and, and I know as a person that, have, that served as a principal for 11 years that the change happens at the local level. And because we've had strong leaders in the schools that we, our theory of change has been that you know change is gonna happen locally and that we have to empower principals. And we've worked so hard to put strong leaders in our schools and we're not you know at 100% yet, but we're working towards that. I firmly believe that elevating the role of principal and doubling down on principal quality has been one of the, the leading drivers. And you know there are a lot of other policies that we'll talk about today, principal evaluation, teacher evaluation being tied to student outcomes and choice and you know some of the other um, more sexy topics, um, for lack of a better phrase. But the one that I really, truly believe, and I'm somewhat biased, is the relationship with the consortium and the, the uh, effective use of data that we have here um, in Chicago. I remember being a part of that change. Um, Paul Zavikowski, who was on the panel earlier, was my first coach when I became a principal back in 2004. And when he came to me with all that data, I was like, what is this? Like, I'm here to teach, I'm here to run the school. And I remember the, the culture changing amongst principals around the use of data, and then the relationship with the consortium. Um, they share pretty sobering statistics with us. And just to give you one quick example of how I was impacted personally as a principal, I remember driving into work and seeing a headline about the number of high school, uh, the number of CPS graduates that graduate from college by age of 25, and then the fact that Latino males and African American males were, were even um, further at the bottom, I think about 3%. And right away, that research spurred action. And you, you saw schools organize themselves around um, you know, creating systems to create better on track and better college enrollment and persistence systems. So I think that um, the relationship between the research community and the, the community of practitioners is very strong here in Chicago. And it's something that should be replicated throughout the country. Uh, Rebecca, and can I ask you to try to stick to two minutes, please? Okay, yeah, because I'm not going to be as articulate <laughs> as, as Janice just was. I'm hoping I can compliment some of my colleagues here on the panel by specifically focusing on current and former English learners, because I think it's important to note that more than a third of CPS students are either active English learners or former English learners, and 80% are Spanish speaking. So I'll be, I'll be quick and, and we can dive into it a little bit more if folks have questions. But since about 2014-15, there's been a number of initiatives to support ELs, and we're really seeing the, the fruits of this with former ELs after they're exiting services doing really well. The first is a district-wide audit for compliance with Illinois services, and this ensured that more kids were being served. 
there was a wide array of professional development, support, and resources targeted at both leaders and teachers, including published instructional and curricular guidance for teachers that I think was really important. And then I'm gonna do three instead of two, because we can't leave out the implementation of the state seal of biliteracy. This has been such an important um, initiative. Last year, there were more than 1,000 students that received the seal. 67% of those were current and former ELs. Just such a beautiful example of home language and culture being assets uh, to striving to a, a reward that really exemplifies college readiness. So I'll keep it short. Great. Thank you. Raymond? Good morning, everyone. Um, first of all, thank you all very much uh, for inviting me here. Thank you for uh, to both the Joyce Foundation and the Spencer Foundation for uh, allowing us to participate. Uh, I am a quantitative researcher, uh, primarily a quantitative researcher by, by trade. Um, and uh, thank you to uh, Sean as well for bringing up uh, Atlanta. Um, there had to be some crazy person to go into Atlanta and run their research and assessment department after their scandal. Uh, I was that crazy person. <laughs> uh, and uh, given that my, my background is, is more quantitative but somewhat qualitative, um, that noise that you hear, pretend that there's a chalkboard behind me. So that noise that you hear behind me is my nails really talking about qualitative research uh, and what the council is learning qualitatively. We have the uh, fortunate uh, opportunity to participate, visit a large number of districts around the country. Uh, we also are interviewing districts. Uh, we too, I won't rehash the quantitative data, but we too have been studying quantitatively um, what the, pro the progress of our large urban cities across the country, what that progress looks like, and those cities that are beginning to mitigate the effects of um, poverty, um, socioeconomic status, a number of other things in our districts, and so Chicago clearly is, is a top. Uh, we have talked to Chicago, we've talked to several other districts, we've visited a number of districts, and I'll quickly share with you um, three quick things that we've learned from those. They are qualitative in nature, uh, so they're a function of our interviews and focus groups, but um, given that, one, uh, what we've noticed is, and, and I'm going to give you uh, a kind of a broader perspective, I guess, from what we've seen, there was a push, as you all know, for teacher effectiveness and teacher evaluation. So there's been a push across the country in terms of teacher evaluation recently. What we're noticing is that there was a byproduct of the teacher evaluation and teacher effectiveness push that wasn't um, firing or getting rid of the lowest performing teachers. What that byproduct actually was is when we said we wanted to focus on evaluating teachers out, there was also a focus on, well, wait a minute, it means we need to make an investment in improving teacher instruction and improving teacher effectiveness. And so that investment, uh, what we're seeing is that those schools that made a concerted effort at investing in improving uh, their teachers, improving their principals, improving their leadership at the district level, particularly from an instructional standpoint, is markedly different than it was in years past. And so it's really a byproduct of the evaluation um, regime, if you will, that we went through. And, and Janice noted it a moment ago when she talked about our princi their principles. We've invested in really improving the instructional prowess of our principles, and we've noticed that across a large number of our districts as we've interviewed districts that seem to be mitigating some of those effects. Uh, the second um, is also uh, a kind of a byproduct of some of the other things that we're learning, and that is uh, there was a transition to college and career-ready standards, or our standards movement. And as you might expect, the transition to standards doesn't necessarily, it, it, it begs the question, uh, if we change the standards for everyone, won't improvement also be kind of equally changed? Uh, those kids who are lowest performing aren't gonna perform much better than those kids who are highest performing because we change the standards for everyone. What we notice, though as a function of that and, and our conversations is that the conversations in the schools around what it means to be uh, on grade level for third grade or on grade level for fourth grade as a function of those college and career ready standards the conversations amongst teachers principals and district administrators began to shift to what does this really mean and that focus on what does this really mean also led to a focus on well how do we get there um, and so that, that shift or that transition that we're seeing or that we're hearing is that we had never really had conversations about what it meant to be on grade level for a third grader. 
Uh, and I'll give you another example. I use kindergarten as an example. Many of us have, have heard kind of the adage recently that, oh, what it takes to be a kindergartner now is much more difficult than what it took to be a kindergartner when I was in school. And in order to know that, you have to have thought about what it takes to be a kindergartner now. And we haven't had those conversations traditionally. So just having those conversations, having those coherent conversations between teachers, principals, administrators, those who are trying to improve student achievement uh, has made a difference. And the last, you know, I'll do three instead of two if it's okay. Uh, the last that we've seen amongst our districts is scale. Um, what we've seen in the districts that we've visited and spoken to is that where they've tried to make improvements at scale, meaning the entire district is moving in the same direction, uh, we've noticed significant changes. And I'll, I'll give you uh, some examples. Um, one of which is, if you can imagine, uh, the teacher effectiveness piece. The teacher effectiveness piece was, we're going to implement teacher effectiveness at scale. All of our teachers will be evaluated collectively. And that discussion began to change at scale. Uh, if you think about the standards movement, that went across the district as a whole. Uh, some other of our reform efforts tend to, uh, I'll pick on one, but not, not on purpose, but uh, our school choice uh, reform efforts tend to move a few students from one building to another or move a few students into uh, more high-performing schools, as an example. But it's not going to get the movement that we've seen at scale in some of the districts where we said we're going to implement things across the entire district. We've also uh, noticed for some of our districts that um, individual schools have made improvements when the individual autonomy of schools has been allowed to produce changes, but that hasn't moved the entire district at scale. It's when districts say we're going to plan for scale, we're going to implement at scale, that the district has moved at scale. Thank you. Greg? No, it's really difficult as a practitioner to couch the improvements within one or two areas. Um, I'll do my best to keep it short, but at, at its core, I, I do believe that changes in principal practice has been the cornerstone of the work. Um, this is my six year as a high school principal, and my experience as a principal was vastly different than what I experienced as a teacher working with my principal. Now, I'm a product of Chicago Public School. I went to high school here, elementary school, and, and taught in Chicago, so I have a historical perspective to offer. Um, but what I've noticed is that uh, for the last six to ten years, in my experience as a leader, the district has provided a lot of support, mostly around instructional leadership with coaching. Um, I've been a principal for six years again, and I've had a coach for six years. As an assistant principal, I had uh, a mentor principal uh, once. She's sitting on, this, on the panel with us today. <laughs> <laughs> but also programs... Um, like the University of Illinois Chicago um, urban, urban Leadership Program for Principal Preparation, mentoring programs, residencies, is hugely impactful for what we're seeing in schools. Second, and perhaps most importantly, we should not undervalue the changes that's happening in the classroom. Yes. Teacher practice today is unlike what I've seen as a teacher, but also in my experiences as a student in the district. Janice and I, we've had this conversation a number of times. Uh, our teachers today were better teachers than we were as teachers. Mm -hmm. And I'm seeing the type of work, the type of planning, how our teachers are using data to influence um, student outcomes and teacher teams. So what is happening in, a, in, in what I refer to as the gut of the school is what teachers are doing each and every day with students in front of them. And lastly, the freshman on track rate is the driver in Chicago public schools. It is the one metric that has remained consistent. Uh, when I arrived at Kenwood in the spring of 2012, our freshman on track rate was 58%. And we finished that year at 71%, knowing that my four-year graduation rate, I believe it was the class of 2015, 2016, was going to be much lower than what it is now. It is the driver not only of student outcomes, including four-year graduation rate, um, college enrollment, and persistent, but something we don't measure, uh, particularly quantitatively, is the academic and social culture of students feeling as if they belong. So at its core, you know, one, uh, teacher practice, uh, principal leadership, and the freshman on track rate has been significant drivers in the way our schools have improved, um, at least in my six years as a leader in Chicago. 
I, I think I'm going to pick up right where you left off, Greg, because, and I'm going to focus starting out at the district level at the continuous improvement mindset that the district has had over all of these years. And I think what you see when you look across the country at urban districts is, um, you know, the superintendency is a high turnover position. Um, and, you know, the new superintendent comes in and brings their own set of cornerstone foundational initiatives. And a lot of times the, the past initiatives get swept away. And what we've seen in Chicago is that, you know, there have been turnover in the CEO position, but that things like freshmen on track have remained the heartbeat. They've remained the consistent thread that's gone from one administration to the next. And one thing that I think doesn't get talked about enough in that is the roots of that, I think, are in the relentless commitment that our uh, leaders that started out as practitioners in the school district, so people like Janice Jackson, Alan Mather, Liz Kirby, um, so many of our principals that have been in the system over so many years, that they have been the ones that have been the heart and around the kind of coherence and consistency of this focus on data over time. And in such a courageous way, you know, Janice, you told the story about driving in in your car and, you know, hearing that number for the first time. It takes a lot of courage to look that number in the face and really strive to make improvements, to not try to say the number isn't real, to not turn your back and run away. And so I, I would point to that consistency over time. And that mindset, what that's done for Chicago is to say, we're going to keep working on this. We're going to keep tweaking and adding things that are going to make this more effective. So the research pointed the way, but it's not enough. And so now we're going to get the right real-time data in the hands of practitioners on the ground. We're going to provide the type of human capital development that our principals and, our, and the, the type of strategic te teacher evaluation and development that practitioners deserve. Um, we're going to provide real in-time training like the work that the Network for College Success has done um, over so many years. In terms of really learning, helping our practitioners to understand and use data in a way that moves practice. And I think that takes a continuous improvement mindset that starts at the district level and goes all the way down into the schools. And I think as a part of that, um, what Janice and Alan and Liz and other CPS leaders have done is they've embraced practitioners, the solutions and the paths forward about how to improve the data have come from practice on the ground, which I think is really important. I would put around that just a quick second. Um, many of the people who sit in this room, the education ecosystem in Chicago, which when I started in this space in 1995, was really very empty, lonely space. And what you see now is a very vibrant community. We have incredible philanthropy here, including our hosts, the Joyce and Spencer Foundations, but so many others, who use not only strategic philanthropy to drive policy and advocacy work so strategically, but they also are um, sometimes our nudges and sometimes our fierce pushers um, to remind us what's important and push us in a direction. And then the nonprofit um, space in terms of advocacy and policy, organizations like Advance Illinois and the Fund, um, one million degrees, you know, the list just goes on and on. And I believe that that ecosystem all driving towards this common goal has been a really significant part of the Chicago story. So in that respect, I think this story is about Chicago public schools. It's about um, professional development opportunities, bringing together research, evidence, and training like the To and Through project. But it's also about many of the people who are sitting in this room who have stuck with this work so relentlessly and in coherent and consistent ways over the past decade. Great. Thank you. So I, I want to talk for a minute about one of the weak spots, which is um, Paul spoke about, which is low-income African-American students, that there have been gains overall, but th those have been at a slower pace. And Paul found that since 2011 in the elementary school, they've been pretty flat. So let's talk about why that is and what can CPS do to tackle that. Uh, seems like a question for Janice or Greg. Yeah. Oh. I'm happy to jump in. So, you know, as an African-American woman, every time I see the data, you know, it's, it's always predictable where African-American students are going to fall. Um, while we celebrate the progress that, that has been made, it is still troubling to see the achievement gap. I think that um, there are a number, of a number of things that we're trying out. Number one is not allowing poverty, race, or any of those things stop 
the work that has been talked about today at the high school level. So although that achievement gap persists, we continue to see more and more African American um, students graduating, as Elaine pointed out, more uh, the African American males actually drove some of the increases that we saw this year. Kim Wood was um, highlighted at one of our board meetings because they had, I think, the highest rate of change for African American males. So I think continuing to push, and I think there is something to be said about students still completing high school, enrolling in college, and graduating because that, that really is the North Star. But the other piece is really strengthening the pre-K through 14 um, or P20 um, system in Chicago. And one of the things that we are doing in the city that I really believe in is access to early education. And it's still a struggle. Um, the district has spent a lot of time um, uh, and energy and, and resources opening up uh, preschool full day options throughout the city. And we still see some gaps. There are some communities, in particular in the Latino community, where the um, waiting list is long, the, uh, you know, the classrooms are bursting at the seams, or at 20, because that's the state requirement. Um, but then in some of our uh, uh, low income African American communities, we have been working really, really hard to uh, fill those seats and help the parents understand the importance of getting children in school sooner. Um, along those lines, again, tapping back into research from the university community, looking at things like the 30 million words project out of U, U of C with uh, Dr. Suskin, I believe. Um, you know, and just really helping our parents understand that the sooner students are in school, the better. The one thing, oh, and there's one data point that I would like to share related to that. So we started our preschool initiative just about, we're in the, the fourth year, and I, I do think it's important to note the correlation between the number of students who actually require remediation at the third grade level. So uh, earlier, someone talked about our retention rate. In 2011, we had 11,000 third graders who needed to attend, uh, 11,000 uh, third graders who needed to attend um, summer school. And this year, it was less than um, 6,000 students. And so when you see that kind of dramatic gap, it does speak to the fact that if students are in school sooner, they acquire language, they're more likely to read sooner and you know access um, the curriculum that's presented to them in schools. And I think that's one strategy that has a lot of promise for um, African American students in particular, and I would love for us to, to look deeper there. And then the last piece that's connected to that, and Rebecca and I were kind of chatting about this um, at our table, is I think I think that something is there with regard to the work that we've done with EL students, and I think that African American students can benefit from some of those practices. Um, a lot of the concerns that I see, they are language issues. And I think if we can get school students in school sooner, I think if we can get them acquiring a larger vocabulary, uh, language acquisition, the academic language, they will be able to access the curriculum in ways that they have not been able to do on par with their peers. And so I think that there's something there with regard to access to early education. So we focused a lot on getting students into the programs. And as a district, I would say in the last year, we've been focusing a lot more on uh, kindergarten readiness. So when Ray pointed out, like, people can't, you know, we have a lot of debates in CPS about what it means to be kindergarten ready. Should they be able to read by the time they get to kindergarten? What does that mean? I think we've done a lot as a district, and that is making me more excited about um, future NAEP scores and other um, standardized assessments that our students will take, because I do believe that because we're getting kids in school sooner, that they're doing much better long term. Can I just uh, to tweak it for Greg a little bit? You know, this population, low-income African-American students, are the same population that are in a lot of our under-enrolled high schools that have limited resources, you know, limited course offerings, sort of dying institutions. How much does that play into the low achievement that we're seeing? Um, you know, I, so our school demographics... Um, I know it's not the case for your right, school. Right, doesn't particularly fit um, the question, but as a practic practitioner, I've learned that at our school, our students are, our male students are performing well. As a matter of fact, um, our boys' PSAT 9, 10, and SAT scores were higher than our girls, mm -hmm. um, as well as higher than the district, the state, and the national average. But what we've learned is that African-American boys still are not growing when, they look, when you look at the grade point average. So for instance, the consortium provided data based upon last year's freshman on track um, performance in which we had 96% of our ninth graders, which are current 10th graders on track, 
but the talent loss for African American boys was greater than any other demic subgroup. Mm -hmm. um, African American boys entering Kenwood High School with a 3.0 grade point average lost close to a four point. That's a problem. And so we're trying to formulate a counter narrative in our school around how we're best serving this population and the supports that they need, both cognitive as well as not cognitive skills, that we're not doing a very good job of. So we're seeing some movement, particularly in the big numbers, high school graduation rate, on track rate, as well as standardized test scores. But when you look at enrollment in AP courses, um, mm -hmm. uh, the talent loss that I just mentioned, we're still facing challenges that at this point we don't have the answer for. I was going to go directly to the point that you made, mm -hmm. Greg, um, and um, on the gender gap um, in particular, because I think that's a really important question beyond looking at the African-American achievement gap, but looking at African-American males mm -hmm. in particular, um, because that's part of the driver behind this gap. And, and I also think the point that you made about the focus on non-cognitive skills is really important. For those of you that haven't seen it, Camille Farrington has done a really beautiful, um, and her colleagues, her team at the consortium have done beautiful work really trying to understand non-cognitive factors, the way that they are um, accessed and developed in classrooms. And part of the discovery of the research is that how we organize classrooms and how we organize schools really has a significant influence on grit, perseverance, mindset, study habits, and other things. And so to me, it feels like so there are some answers in there in terms of unlocking the ways that we organize instruction in ways that engage and reach males. Because clearly the issue is in our engagement of them. The talent is there, the ambition is there. So my big question going forward is, how do we really help to support and reach and engage African American males better than we are today? Ray, do you want to have a quick last word so we can move on to another yep, Quick topic? last word. Um, I believe, and I don't want to misattribute, but I believe Ball's report uh, talked about the fact that maybe 83,000 African American students had left Chicago public schools for suburban area districts. Um, I would surmise, although I don't have the data, I would surmise that those kids who left the district were kids who actually had the means to leave the district. Um, what we've noticed in other school districts around the country that we've worked with is that when kids move between schools, we often attribute free reduced price lunch as one big large group. But the kids, there are kids who are at the higher end of the free and reduced price lunch spectrum, and there are kids at the much lower end of the free and reduced price lunch spectrum. And if we look at the African American kids, I would suspect that some of the schools that are remaining, they're kids that are more likely to be in abject poverty who did not have the means to move. And so what it really begs the question of is, how do we move the needle for kids who are in abject poverty conditions, which is a much greater challenge we've seen across our districts, than moving kids at the higher end of the free and reduced price lunch spectrum, or even kids with higher means. And so the real challenge is how do we dig into uh, abject poverty and what it takes to move kids in abject poverty who often don't have the means or wherewithal to transition from what one school to another, and they remain in their neighborhood schools. Mm -hmm. uh, I want to switch over to the other major student group in CPS, which is Latinos. They, they're they now you know, the largest student population in the school district on pace to become the majority you know, any day now. So, so the question, Rebecca, I want to help understand, not only do they score a little bit higher than African Americans, they've been accelerating at a faster rate. Help us understand what do you think some of the contributing factors are behind that. Yeah, I have, I have a hard time generalizing the whole Latino mm -hmm. subgroup. Mm -hmm. um, it's a really diverse subgroup. I, I mean, I, if you think of an example of a third generation child mm -hmm. who's maybe his family's homeowners and they're growing up near Midway and it's mainly English spoken at home and how that differs from maybe another child in La Villita whose parents recently came, it's mainly Spanish at home. Maybe one or both the parents are undocumented and unfamiliar with the system. So I have a really hard time with generalizing and that's why I keep coming back to current and former ELs where I think there's a commonality in their learning trajectory and we are seeing great gains on the NWA map for sixth, seventh, and eighth grade eighth graders, there's three-year trend data on former ELs outperforming native English speaking peers. And Noel, there's not trend data yet. It's surprising that in 2017, 
current ELs, there was a substantial number that were outperforming on reading uh, than their native English speaking peers. So it's, it's, it's curious um, as to why they're doing well. And it was a little bit of what, what Janice alluded to in our conversation, some, some hypotheses about that. But I think there's something particularly good are meaningful that could be going on in classrooms with a teacher who's been prepared to support a student to do well on access. That's the English language proficiency exam. And that's a teacher who's prepared to build both academic language and content area learning. You know, Common Core tried bringing into the mainstream how both language and content are in inextricably linked. But for bilingual ESL specialists, they've always been thinking that way. They're always thinking about the language demands in a, in, in a unit along with the content area demands. And what we've seen is that kids get a jump in social language pretty quickly, but getting that deeper academic language takes more time. And they might have stronger academic language in one discipline over the other. But that writing domain, because it assesses speaking, reading, and, and writing, the writing domain is the toughest to develop. It usually is what can keep kids under the classification longer. But it, it makes us wonder if kids have a strong foundation in that writing domain. Is that, is that part of what's speaking to their academic progress um, once they leave services? Um, but there also um, was, I, I mentioned about this broad array of, of professional development and support that happened. Really good stuff that, that I think, just like we said, can't be a trend that we want to continue. Um, and one big thing was, was a, you know, we're talking about principals and their preparation, but they were attending institutes on ESL, on home language, on the socio-emotional needs of immigrants. The Office of Language and Culture restructured in 2015, and a really exciting thing they did was provide an EL expert to each network. It's like a job coach to directly work with instru instructional support leaders, to intervene in schools with large English learner populations. There was frequent monitoring. We keep talking about that as a theme. And there was expanded professional development for teachers and principals on ESL standards, unit design, with academic language goals integrated with content standards. And a lot of this, like I mentioned, was published uh, for folks to access. They also did collaborations with the Mexican consulate. Um, the home language was weak before 2015. And they didn't want to just talk about home language. They needed authentic models of Spanish language. And so those kind of collaborations mattered. There was a lack of home language resources K through three. So they expanded their libraries. Um, and they encouraged more teachers to get the bilingual ESL endorsement. So there was really, uh, they even rewrote the board policy on bilingual programs. So there was a, a real effort um, to, to think about these kids and I think it's bearing its fruit. Let's talk for a second about elementary schools. It's very easy on the high school level. There's been a lot of talk and things written about the ninth grade on track as sort of a core measure that's helped transform high schools. There's no corollary for the elementary school. Um, can you help us unpack some of the key things that you think are happening in the elementary schools specifically? And is some of it, as you talked about, Janice, the idea that kids are coming to school simply better prepared? This is one of the things Sean mentioned in his research. There's a chance, part of it is maybe explained by, you know, kids are coming to kindergarten, uh, you know, in a more sophisticated way than they did previously. I think, I mean, I definitely think that the, the effort to get students in school sooner has paid off to a certain degree. Um, but I think Ray made the point earlier when we talked about the transition to, I keep saying Common Core Standards, I know they have a new name, College and Career Readiness Standards. I think it really transformed our elementary schools. And when we conducted our interview with the Council of Gray City Schools, we talked about the fact that CPS rolled out, I think in 2012, a lot of initiatives at the same time. That's the same year we rolled out teacher evaluation, transition to Common Core, the principal evaluation system, et cetera. And I remember being a sitting principal at that time and people were like, this is too much. We're doing too much too fast. And in particular, at the high school level, we did not adopt the Common Core as quickly as our elementary schools did. But it was large scale. Um, central office, the networks were all organized around that implementation. And I really do believe that that has, um, you know, um, lead, led to some of these uh, changes. Number one, we started talking about curriculum in a really different way. We moved away from what some would describe as like teaching to the test or ISAT prep or, you know, people kind of working in these loosely coupled um, 
teams or, or silos in some cases. And we really start having conversations as a district about what it means to be on grade level. What do these standards mean? And I think the way that the standards are organized um, as a progression over time, we were able to really narrow down and, and figure out that there are only, you know, for reading, maybe five discrete skills that we're teaching over time. And I think when you start to unpack it like that, that's really easy for teachers to understand as opposed to giving them, you know, a thick, dense list of standards that people really didn't understand. So when I think about what's happening at our elementary schools, I think it's that. The other piece, although um, it's not assessed, I think the focus on um, writing has, has really helped. And in the schools where I see a lot of dramatic changes, it's almost uh, certain that writing is um, uh, an area of focus and in places where I see them, you know, maybe make a few uh, superficial gains or even declines, there there isn't a, a heavy focus on the writing piece. And so I think um, study in Common Core, the fact that we, you know, took a very aggressive approach to implementing with fidelity has led to some of the changes that we've seen. The, the second piece is the link between not only the curriculum the instructional shifts that Common Core called for, but also the use of data again. We administer the NWEA MAP assessment in CPS, and uh, we do it at the beginning of the year, middle of the year, and end of the year. The only one that's mandatory is the end of the year assessment, I believe. Am I correct? Yes. I mean, it's the end of the year. And what's uh, uh, interesting to me is there's a lot of talk about testing and double testing, but I believe about 95% of our schools take, I'm sorry, 85% of our schools take the beginning of the year, middle of the year, and end of the year assessment. And then there are other schools who maybe do beginning of the year, end of the year, and, and have reasons for doing that. Um, but it speaks to the fact that teachers and principals see value in administering that assessment um, over time throughout a school year because they, they get the data back quickly. They're able to, um, you know, it, it, they're able to make adjustments to the curriculum as a result. And I think that that has also led to some of the changes that we've seen. I was, I was going to add to that too, you know, going right from where you left off on data, Janice, mm -hmm. I, I think the way that CPS has, has strategically used data for bo both accountability and supports and so summative data, but also formative, formative data yeah. um, that's sort of become the, the heartbeat. And, and that there's been a set of supports that's been built around that. So data strategists at the network level, yeah. reach training for teachers. Um, and so data has become the backbone, but it's different kinds of more nuanced types of data, both for accountability and some that are structured specifically for supports. And mm -hmm. I think that's been a really important part of the improvement of elementary schools. I, I wanted to ask about the data because there's, you know, there's two sides, mm -hmm. right? It's great. It helps drive improvement. It helps drive support, but it also can drive a culture mm -hmm. in a school in a negative way. Mm -hmm. um, and I know lots of researchers have looked at it and discounted it as a major factor mm -hmm. or even a significant factor in test score gains. But, you know, we've reported WBEZ about the high school graduation rates. Mm -hmm. I've reported about on track rate schools that have fudged their attendance mm -hmm. to help boost their ninth grade on track rates. Mm -hmm. I mean, I also saw lots of schools doing fantastic things around ninth grade on track. I'm not suggesting that's not happening, but there, it's human nature mm -hmm. to bend to the measure that you you fall and you live and die by. You know, mm -hmm. part of the reason schools take math three times a year is because that's what their ranking is based on. They want to do well. Yeah. So how much does that affect a school culture and the kind of real authentic learning that we want kids to do rather than just being able to, you know, perform on a test? I'll take that one. <laughs> All right. you know, great. Because, and I was just speaking to somebody about this now, in the spirit of full disclosure, I believe in accountability. I just do. Um, and I'll start with kind of the, the philosophical piece. And my entire life, I've spent my life working with um, low-income African-American and Latino students. And at the end of the day, nobody's going to give them a job or hire them if they have not demonstrated proficiency. And so when I walk in schools or communities or districts where there is not a focus on students showing proficiency, um, and it's explained away as, you know, not wanting to put pressure on them or, you know, these other explanations. I personally believe that we're doing them a disservice. I think you have an even larger hurdle to get over as a minority and they have to be prepared. So that's the first step. I understand human nature and I do believe with greater transparency, which is really what the data is, 
that you do have people who, who um, do things that they should not be doing. But I also think that this has evolved over time. For example, with our graduation rate, when the issue around transfers came out, CPS changed you know, some of its practices to make it, because we want the data to mean something. We don't want to put out data that can be discredited because of a technical glitch or something that we missed in our policy structure um, that, that allows for you know, gaming of the system. But just on that uh, metric with graduation, if you look at the changes that we've made, 30,000 more students have graduated from Chicago public, schools, high, Chicago public schools since these reform changes. That cannot be discounted. That, those are real numbers. When you see that 44% of our kids are enrolling in college at the same rate as the national average, those are real numbers. And so I think that with greater accountability and data, you know, there, you're going to have some of those things happen, but I think it's our job as a district to continue to make sure that the data um, holds up under scrutiny and that we have integrity in what we do. Um, but personally for me, I, I would not be a part of any system that did not set the highest expectations for children because those are the expectations they're going to be met with. I would even say they're going to be doubly higher. Those are the expectations they're going to be met with when they go off into the real world, and we're doing them a disservice if we do not start preparing them earlier. If I may, um, on the data, one of the things that we've noticed about data is that all of our districts that we work with across the country utilize data. Uh, they've all got data, they've all got assessments. A couple of years ago when we were um, doing an assessment study, uh, I actually flew to Chicago and spent two days going around and meeting with principals in Chicago public schools, uh, high school, I actually sat in on grade level uh, leadership team meetings. What I was struck by more than anything else was not the use of data, but the conversations that were being had around data. And I think that's the, the strength, one of the strengths of data is not the data in and of itself. It's okay, how are we going to go about using it? What are we going to do? What does it tell us? Uh, and so when I sat in some of those meetings with principals, I was really struck by the fact that uh, as I traveled to other districts, I hadn't heard the depth of conversations about what the data was showing as I heard when I was here in Chicago. I think to, you know, this is the question that you asked, Kate, just about making sure that there are external partners who help to keep an eye on the data and, and are neutral observers, experts who ensure that there is some balance um, in the reporting that comes from the district. I mean, I think this is one of the powerful parts of the Chicago story. We have the consortium plays that role. Um, Elaine and Jenny, the, the director and deputy director, are excellent stewards in that respect of this work. And I feel like it is the job of organizations like the consortium, um, like the organization that Paul runs, to actually be neutral and measure um, externally in a way that's trustworthy to the public. Um, that's part of the promise, I think, that the ecosystem around the school district makes in order to make sure that we're attending to some of the questions and critiques that you have or that you've raised um, in your question. So I do think there's an important role, and Janice, you highlighted that partnership in, in your opening remarks. That's one of the important components of that partnership is that aspect as well. And let me add, I, I think the data is a driver in the academic culture of a school. Um, this past spring, and I'll highlight a particular school that's obviously separate from Kenwood, um, I had a chance to lead some work um, with the fund in which I was facilitating professional learning community with, with other principals. So I took a team over, and this is 7.30 in the morning, to Washington High School, um, close to Indiana, and they had a, a, an instructional leadership team meeting that talked only about data, and students were engaged in the meeting looking at what was the drivers to, uh, to school change, but also what was needed to improve student performance, with students being a part of the conversation with teachers. And I hadn't seen that, and, and we've had some amazing outcomes in our school, but to walk into another school and learn what they're doing by just listening to what young people and teachers are saying about practice tells me everything I need to know about the school culture, not their performance report. Mm -hmm. You know, so I think in short, um, the data that we're looking at is driving um, the academic culture, but also it drives teacher practice. And, you know, sometimes I, I think we get overwhelmed with um, accountability in a negative sense, but, you know, as a person that's on the ground, it's really impacting what we're doing in our schools. Um, and now I want to ask the question of, um, you know, the last many years, one budget crisis after another at CPS, 
you know, a lot of principal turnover, to, you know, you, you talked about how important that has been in terms of advancing Chicago, yet there's been a lot of turnover. Those things can feel very contradictory. We have all these gains, but at the same time, a lot of chaos, a lot of instability, a lot of under-resourced schools. Can someone speak to that contradiction? How, how, do, how, do we, how are we gaining when we're, you know, holding on by our fingernails? <laughs> <laughs> I think to that's me. that's one of the reasons why um, we're inviting people because I think it's remarkable. Um, I see Forrest hiding at the top, so I'm going to save that answer. <laughs> um, but but I think he'll speak to that um, in some of the closing remarks. But I, I do think that it goes back to this piece around the leadership at the school level. And even when we saw transition of um, high performing principals, that was probably more troubling. One of the things I chose to focus on was um, the principals who stayed in the district, because that told me a lot more about where the district was going and what the district needed. What I will say is that I think, um, despite all of the chaos, that it really took um, strong leadership, um, both at the classroom level and at the principal level, um, in order to, to maintain that because, you know, it was crazy. You, I talked to people who um, had served in a district for 20 or 30 years and I would say, you know, because I was new in this role and I was like, is this the worst you, that you've ever seen? And they would say yes. And I was like, wow, like that scared the mess out of me. But to see us, it, it did. But to see us on the other side and I think the, the leadership team coming in, um, you know, for as being expert in managing a crisis, that, that's what he did. And, and I was there to help with the academics and the day-to-day -day piece. And I think that the mayor put together the right team to, to take us through, through this crisis. But I also think that was at the high level. And I know that both of us took the approach. We're here to buffer and solve problems at the top, but allowing principals the autonomy and authority to do what they needed to do um, at the local level. And it wasn't easy. But with that said, I think that the work we're doing around principals is critically important. And although, you know, retention and churn is still a, an issue, CPS has one of the um, um, highest retention rates of a, a large urban school system. And I think that that's something that should be talked about as well. You know, it's always in, you know, important to talk about why good principals leave, but we have a lot of principals who stay and actually stay um, much longer than they do in some other districts. And I think it's because of the ecosystem that Sarah talked about to support not only the school system, but there's a lot of support for principals. And if you go around the country, that's not common in, in every school system. Um, and that just makes us the last question. And we've talked a lot about a gains. And I'm wondering if you could think about, if you could envision like your ideal school where you felt like kids were being supported, they're growing on all, you know, the whole child, all that good stuff. Are we seeing enough of it? And if not, what more? What more do you want? What What, what do you see that we're not doing? Well, Kate, visit Kimball. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> That's what I was going to say. Go to Westinghouse. That's it. You know, I, you know, I I think there's a lot of good things happening in all of our schools, and Kimball is one example. Um, the social emotional support is still a space where we're not. Um, reaching uh, optimum level. Mm -hmm. um, it's such a laser focus on teaching and learning that oftentimes we tend to exclude the work of clinicians in our building. Mm -hmm. For instance, I have one social worker that serves um, close to 1,800 students and um, five school counselors. And we're trying to provide a space for them um, to provide the, the wraparound services that young people need and deserve. Um, but it's so much of our time fully committed to the academic space that we often forget about um, the needs of young people going through adolescenthood. Mm -hmm. I would say as a person that has visited almost all of the schools that we, we definitely have a lot of uh, great schools. And, and to answer your question, there, there aren't enough, um, in particular at the high school level. So that's why that's been a focus for the district in the past two years, because we do have you know, quite a few high schools that um, are severely under-enrolled, as you talked about. And I do think, as we think about CPS going forward, those are some of the challenges that we have to address. Um, some of the schools do not have a student population that you know, is going to be able to provide them with the kind of funding um, that's needed in order to have what everybody in this room considers to be a high quality education. And we have to do something about that. Um, I don't believe that that means um, abandoning the, the uh, philosophy around choice that we have in the district. Um, I 
debate people about this all the time, but I, I, the one thing I say about choice is that low-income families deserve to have the same um, rights as any other person. And I remember growing up, my parents exercised choice before they knew what it was called, sending their kids outside of the community to selective enrollment schools and programs. And I think every parent in Chicago um, should have that, that opportunity. And I think that the competition that it has created, you know, there are some, some um, negative outcomes or unintended outcomes as a result of that. But I think overall, we see all tides rising. And that is a positive thing. Um, and in places where it's not happening, I think now, especially given the position that the district is in, a, a much more stronger position, now there's an opportunity to look at those schools and figure out what's the right approach in order to um, either reinvest, like we're doing in Inglewood, where you have four schools that are severely under-enrolled and the community came together to kind of take, put the, take their destiny into their own hands. We need more of that happening in some of the communities where we continue to see, as you term them, schools that are hollowed out. Right, well, and I just, I can't resist. Mm -hmm. So, you know, we have the moratorium that's in place, but it's lifting at the end of this year. Do, do you anticipate closing more high schools? I think we've made clear where we are as a district and what we think um, is working is working directly with communities. Um, community leaders and people who follow this, they're smart. They understand that if you're in a building with 1,800 students, there are just some economies of scale that work better than trying to kind of piece it together with less than 300 um, students. Um, but our approach, which I think is working, has been a community-driven approach and really work in communities that are ready to have that conversation. And so for the foreseeable future, that's the approach that we plan to take. And I don't know if Forrest wants to add more to that later. <laughs> yeah. Right, because not every community is, is anxious for that. And, you know, some argue Englewood, you yeah. know, it was someone else's idea and mm -hmm. then they kind of, you know, came along. No. So not I every think, community is organized enough to I say, well, they, know what they want yeah. or be receptive to an idea from CPS. They, they aren't. And that goes back to, and that's why our vision is centered around, you know, continuing the academic gains, financial stability, and also integrity because it plays a big role. But the thing that I say to people who critique that, and I'll take anybody in this room up on that offer, walk through some of these schools with me. It is heartbreaking. And there is no way that I will, in this position, allow um, schools to exist that aren't good enough for my own children. I don't think anybody should want that. So we have to have policies and procedures in place that are good for everybody's child and not just other people's children. And so the, it's an open invitation. If you want to walk through what some of these schools look like and see what principals do, like the principal, uh, I, I talked to a principal at a school the other day, they're, they're really working under some pretty... Um, um, remarkable circumstances and I think that we have to do something about that and I think the community is learning I think a lot of the communities impacted need help and support understanding what's going on um, and we learned a lot from the way we did closings in the past and we don't want to repeat that but it still does not um, allow us to walk away from our responsibilities of making sure that every kid is in a high quality environment and we're not there yet great well I um, hope you join me in thanking the panelists <laughs>
but I let me start laughing immediately. Let which just, I'll talk let, to y'all later. Let me just say, Robin's been very active in Chicago education for a couple of decades now. She's now the chair of the Staines Family Foundation. Before that, she was over about eight years the director of Advance Illinois. So, but you have to listen very carefully because she's going to explain how to get your lunch. <laughs> <laughs> yes, we so have. Yeah. All right, so it's so fun to give instructions to people but since nobody at home listens to me, so thank you. <laughs> and um, what's gonna happen is you're gonna go out, you're gonna get your lunch, you're going to bring it back in here straight away. You are allowed to go to the restrooms. Just wanna make that point clear. Um, we've been advised by the janitorial staff to make that point clear. But you have an assignment. We're gonna come back, we're gonna reconvene as a large group and we're gonna have a conversation. And in order for that to be a really good, focused, stimulating conversation, you've got some homework while you're eating. Find a couple of people. It can be the people you're sitting next to now or if you don't think they're interesting enough, find somebody new. <laughs> and take a few minutes Think about what you've heard this morning about the changes that have happened in Chicago, about the thinking of some of um, Smarty Pants folks that we've had up here, about why those things are happening. And then what we want to talk about is what are those implications going forward? Specifically, given all of this, what should we be doing differently or more of or less than going forward in the areas of policy, practice and program, and research? What are the implications? Your job when we come back is when I say, okay, let's talk about some of the recommendations, you will have talked and you will have vetted and you will have really smart things to say in each of those. We're going to collect those and we're gonna then share those back in a variety of ways. So this is not just idle chit chat amongst ourselves. The hope is that we will use this as a roadmap going forward in a variety of, of good ways. So, and please think about that, not just in terms of Chicago, but you can take me out of Advance Illinois, but you can't take Advance Illinois out of me. Also think about it from a state point of view, okay? Because some of the things you heard here were Chicago specific and some um, were related to what was happening at the state level. So recommendations, policy, program and practice, research, Chicago, statewide, or anything else if you want. That's your ticket for getting your lunch. Please come straight back and enjoy it. And then we're gonna start talking even before you've finished. So be, be as quick and efficient as you can be and we'll talk soon. So we have a lot to get through in a short period of time. This is an important conversation. Um, and I, I you know, wanna add my, personal notes that I'm, I think it's really important that we're having this conversation. There was a long time where it was obvious, I think, to those of us who were looking at the data that Chicago was making real progress across multiple domains and you couldn't dismiss it. It was steady, it was consistent. And you just couldn't get people to pay attention. And the problem with that is it means then you're not having the critical conversations you need to have, both to interrogate that information to make sure you're seeing what you think you're seeing, but then also to draw some conclusions and make some, you know, decide, well, what does that suggest going forward in a variety of ways? So I'm delighted we're doing it now. I'm gonna slightly reverse the order. So I'm hoping that there are some of you that have some thoughts to share. If it's the case that the, you've been seeing these kinds of gains the way that our panelists talked about it, if, as Peter Cunningham, who was our ever so incisive note taker, reflects, these are some of the hypotheses, that's what's up there, right? About why what are the implications going forward in some of the key domains? And I'm gonna start us on program and practice because everything really should flow ultimately to supporting good program, good practice. What recommendations did some of you come up with in the program and practice area as natural implications? And raise your hand, we'll call on you and then there's a mic. All right, right over there. Of course you're on the other side of the room. <laughs> this is your exercise for the day and it's free. And please introduce yourself so everyone knows who's talking. Hi everybody, I'm Gina Kniva. I'm a uh, teacher librarian at Limblu Math and Science Academy. Um, so I guess I have a question and a recommendation. Um, Ms. Navarro stated how with EL students, their home language and culture is seen as an asset um, and something to be leveraged to use. Um, I wonder how our district could do the same for African American students in high poverty uh, situations. Okay. Uh, oftentimes it's not seen as an asset but as a deficit, um, and as a teacher for 14 years um, in African American schools, um, for eight years in the neighborhood schools, um, that conversation never really came about. So I'm wondering um, how to do that as a district and how to start those conversations at the school level. All right, thank you. In the program and practice, so I'm hearing take some of what we're seeing work in ELL, try to apply to some of our groups. Other thoughts in the program and practice area? Yes, Josh, introduce yourself. 
Uh, Josh Kaufman with uh, Teach Plus. I, one of the things that really strikes me about this, um, to the last question you ended with, Robin, about sort of how do you think about this at the state level, is that a lot of the very impressive gains we've seen, though certainly there's a lot more room to grow, in Chicago have not been mirrored in Illinois. And we have an opportunity to, with ESSA and with the implementation of a new set of accountability, you know, a new accountability system uh, that is in many ways partly modeled on what Chicago has done for years. Not entirely, because I think downstate would be very uh, unhappy if they heard that. But there are a lot of elements in it that are similar, freshmen on track and so forth. I think there's a real need to build the capacity of districts outside Chicago to be able to do some of this type of work. So it's not really a question, but I think it's, I guess it is in particular maybe for the philanthropic community, how do you create the type of ecosystem that Janice and several people mentioned as being really critical to make this happen? How do you create that ecosystem when you're talking about southern and central Illinois, where there are districts of just a few hundred students, perhaps, and they don't have the research and data support? Again, again, you don't need to frame it as a question. It's a recommendation. What are implications going forward? Ellen, who, waving strong in the front. <laughs> As a partial answer to that question, I think it's really important that we counter the false narrative about the possibility of making progress. There is a false narrative about Chicago that causes people to feel pessimistic about investing in any kind of um, programs that promise improvement. And, and we heard that from uh, Naila's uh, Lyft driver, we heard it to some extent from some of the questions that were asked at the last panel, and I and I think that has an impact on any chances for also investing in smaller communities um, that are also that are struggling um, downstate Illinois. So uh, whatever we can do to change that narrative at the highest levels and all the way down, I think is really critical. That's obviously part of what we're um, hoping for today, but let's make sure that the story is broadcast. Okay. Important, changing the narrative so people feel like there's a sense of the possible. Other recommendations? Yes, Peter. I would like to see that become a primary category under which we make suggestions and not just a bullet under program. Changing the narrative, you think is its whole other, it's a whole strategy in and of itself ability, we gotta talk about. The whole ability to make a number of the changes that have to be made within the school is going, going to depend about perception and support within the community. And right now, there's so much going against the things that will have to be changed that you are going to have a very difficult time if that point isn't. No, it's a really good point. And, and not to mention that these are cash-strapped times. And people's willingness to invest has something to do with whether they think that investment is going to be put to good use. So there is a lot going on there. So point taken and noted. Oh, I'm so sorry, Sarah. Hi, I'm Sarah Duncan from the University of Chicago Network for College Success. I wanted to build on the last two comments about the counter-narrative. And I think it's important to say how deeply racist the narrative is, and that that's something that we have to hit head on rather than sideways. Um, and on the recommendation side, um, one of the things that we thought made Freshman on Track such a powerful um, metric is that you could uh, monitor it in short cycles. So you could see if it was improving. And when we started working it on track, it was in the 50s. So you could put something in place, and in two weeks you could see movement. And you could see, or not, or see that it worked for your higher achieving students, not your lower, or your girls, and not your boys. And so it allowed for cycles of continuous improvement that was, were not possible on an annual test score um, cycle. You couldn't, you couldn't tell whether what you were doing was working. Steve and then Jeff. Yeah, this is Steve Tozer from UIC, and uh, this was articulated best in our group by Dr. Shelby Cosner, one of our faculty from UIC. Uh, it has to do with something we're doing somewhat at every level, but we need to do a lot better at every level, and that's foster a culture of inquiry among uh, 
school leadership from every level to network chiefs down to principals down to teachers. When teachers, and this also tags on to Sarah's comment, when teachers see themselves as the diagnosers and not the problem to be diagnosed, um, it changes the climate of the school in powerful ways and leads to change teacher practice. If we don't get change teacher practice, we won't get the kinds of outcomes from kids that we need. So fostering the culture of inquiry at every level in the school system. Can you follow that up and give one specific example of how one does that? But you're a professor, so you gotta keep it short. Okay. <laughs> okay, I, I happen to have a 30 minute talk in that. I that know I you now. do. <laughs> Small PowerPoint. So, so thank you for triggering that. I, um, yeah, one example was the example that, that uh, uh, Ray Hart gave about Washington High School led by Kevin Gallick here, where Kevin has had to actually set up and structure teams of teachers to be able to come together to identify the problems of practice, first of all, to do the diagnosing, and then secondly, generate what are the solutions to those problems. When you have teacher ownership of the problem and the solution, it's not a question of trying to gain buy-in, you've got the buy-in from jump. I will even say that I think that's linked, Sarah, to your point, which is when you've got data that you can use on a regular, ongoing basis, it, it invites that kind of conversation and problem solving and inquiry. So my guess is we're gonna see ways that these things begin to connect. Who did I say next, Jeff? And then Acacia. And the great progress that was made, the, you know, catching up 20%, et cetera. But it, it seems that a big, to take the next big step, we have to prevent the gap from opening, right? So the, the, the huge gap that we're really never able to make up, we're just able to chip away at, starts before they're in third grade, starts really before they're in kindergarten. It's not just a question of preschool, it's the whole early childhood experience before they get to school whether that starts at four years old or three years old. And it's not just on the schools. It's a city issue, it's a community issue. And I think we'll be in this room in another 20 years and maybe gain another five or 10% if we don't really get upstream and start to attack this from birth. I will, I will, this is not, I'm gonna break out of my role of moderator for a second and Peter's gonna remember this when we get to research. I think one of the things I was eager to hear about is what is the relationship between the expansion of preschool participation and investment with the changes that you're seeing. I mean, you heard it referenced a little bit, but what do we actually know about, as you've got more third graders who do not need remediation, how many of them participate in preschool and what that, how that's changed over time? Maybe a really important research question for, for that and beyond reasons. Um, Acacia was gonna be next. Thank you. Um, I'm Acacia Wilson-Feinberg. I'm with Educators for Excellence. And um, I'll first say that I was just very excited to hear your comments, Greg. And I appreciate your comments, Steve, because for a long time, when this discussion started today, we just weren't talking about the role of educators. Um, and I was over here just, ah, I know that teachers played a really big part in this. So I appreciate those remarks. And I guess one of the things that I've been wondering about is absolutely the investment in principal leadership is critical. But I wonder what the complementary investments in teacher leadership look like, knowing that, you know, teachers are the biggest in-school factor and they drove a lot of this change. What are the investments that we need to make to continue to elevate that leadership? Um, and I also think about culture change because many educators in Chicago are feeling, I think, pretty beat down. They've been working super hard and they've you know, um, been on the grind. And so how do we also, along with these other investments, invest in um, the culture change and celebration, for lack of a better word, that needs to happen that will help people um, sustain the next wave of this? Um, because we are, you know, we've come so far, but we're not there. And I think people need a refresh and a reinvigoration um, as a part of this. Okay, I'm gonna, if there's one more on program and practice, we'll take it, then I wanna make sure we get through them. I'm gonna move us to uh, policy next. Program and practice, yes. Behind you. I'll just piggyback off that. I'm Joseph Spielberg from Chicago Arts Partnerships in Education. Um, I think two things. One, uh, data that we looked at today is really great for us and for educators and, and uh, schools. But also, I think, um, for teachers in the classroom, really supporting localized assessment is important as well for actual teaching and learning. 
data points that are directly connected to their curriculum on a day-to-day -day basis and supporting that kind of efforts for teachers. Um, and also just on your last point, I think um, our whole society would be in a better place if the role of teacher was a high profile profession that was highly regarded and esteemed and paid appro appropriately. Um, so that one too. Yeah, so changing the narrative also around the, the heroic and the really valuable work that teachers are doing on a day-to-day -day basis. I'm sure there's a lot of support in the room on that. Um, all right, I'm gonna move us to the area of policy. And again, these can be Chicago specific or statewide, just sort of indicate what you have in mind. But who came up with some smart, incisive recommendations around policy implications for this work? Jennifer. I'm not sure if it's smart and incisive, but I think we've taken the first step around funding. Now we need to actually fund the new formula um, so that we are over-investing in... Which your group of? Over-investing in schools that have the most need. Um, and I, I'll just quickly tack on my pro program from the prior, was to identify, let, let's identify those level three schools because I think the majority of them are going to be where a lot of the African-American low-income students, particularly at the elementary level, but also in some cases high school level, but there are some schools at the elementary level where that's concentrated, where we're not seeing those gains, we're not seeing kids make the, the gains in academic language and reading that they're going to need to sustain them through the improvements we're seeing in high school. So let's figure out what those schools are and over-invest in them. It's worth noting, it's an interesting double-edged sword, is it not? Because CPS has made these gains. I mean, when you can see these gains, it makes you feel better about investing. It's an easier argument to make that people should put more money. It's not just going down a rat hole. On the other hand, these gains happen during some of the hardest fiscal, I'm looking at Forrest as I say this, the hardest fiscal, um, under the most challenging fiscal circumstances that the city is, and the state generally has perhaps ever seen. So that's going to be an interesting. Well, why do we need to give it more money? So we're going to, they're going to, they're going to have to be some, um, you know, sensible ways of of talking about that. But hard to argue that funding is not an important piece of this. All right. Yes. Steve Robin Bush from the University of Chicago. Uh, speaking of money, uh, I was very inspired to hear from Mr. Jones about Kenwood, um, and shocked to know that the school has one social worker and five counselors for 1,800 children. And uh, I, it's hard, I mean, one of the things that kids need is good information about where they might go to school, what they might do after they graduate. If you've only got five counselors talking to 1,800 kids about that, I don't see how we're ever gonna make up the information deficit that low-income ha kids have as compared to better-off kids. So uh, More it's amazing that these gains are made in, that, in the face of that real deprivation of support, and it's good to imagine how much better we could do with more support. Okay. Yes. Hi, I'm Emily Crone. Um, I'm actually writing a book about the freshman on track movement in Chicago right now. Um, and uh, Bound to be a bestseller. Oh, yeah, I bet. <laughs> For sure. I know everyone here is going to buy one. For sure. Um, but I think for me, um, the thing that I've spent the most time thinking about as I've been writing this book is how do you connect policy to practice in ways um, that we often don't think about? And so, so often we get so caught up in the policy discussion and the fight over what's the exact right policy. But when you hear people around here talking about the different policies that worked. What did you hear? You heard people saying, we started talking about things after Common Core. We started working together. We started looking at data. And so how do you make sure that each of these policies actually have those pieces of practice um, built into them? And so to me, that, that's both the takeaway from Freshman on Track um, and also hopefully generally improvement in Chicago. So fostering a stronger relationship that we're at our best when policy, when practice is informing policy, policy is informing practice, and data is informing all of that. Is that? Yeah, and when you're getting the of the practice, is supporting that. Yeah, it's aligned. Oops. Ginger. Oh, sorry. Jim and then Ginger. Uh, two points. One, it goes back to the countering the false negative, and I think that we really need to stop making a, a public education a political football. 
whether it's the governor versus the mayor or the union versus the district or the neighborhood schools versus the charters, we're all in this together and yet we argue against each other and we take each other down, which is a real big negative. And I think if we could start, stop doing that, it would be a big plus. Secondly, uh, my children were born in the 1980s and I moved to the suburbs and I raised my children in the suburbs. They went to public schools there. And one thing I saw that was a negative there was an elected school board. And it be because every person had an agenda, started running for the school board, and it really made things difficult. So I think it's an issue that we need to bring into the dialogue and, and avoid that trap because it can be a very negative one. All right, we should stop fighting about the type of school, work on trying to support all that are doing it along these lines, and um, appointed elected school board. We obviously, there's an outlier here in Chicago, and if you look at the results, maybe that suggests that there's th some value to that, at least in this context. Okay, Ginger. I have the microphone. Now. I know, they're just giving it out <laughs> now. They're not, they're, even they're not listening to me, did I tell you? <laughs> Go ahead, Ginger. I'm, I'm Ginger Astro from Advance Illinois. Um, I think, and Josh mentioned this a little bit, I think the thinking about the implications for what's happening in Chicago and what it means for the rest of the state is, is really important because this is not happening in, in many, many districts around the state, particularly in downstate rural um, districts where we know Funding was a huge challenge for them, and how do we, you know, how do we apply these lessons learned to districts around the state? And I think from a policy perspective, we have an opportunity as the state's implementing the Every Student Succeeds Act, what the accountability system looks like, but more importantly, how the state design, uh, designs the supports and intervention systems to use the lessons of Chicago to inform that. And I think that helps um, change the narrative that one, it can't be done, and two, that Chicago somehow um, you know, a pit of despair when in fact they've really changed the narrative. So t really taking the lessons learned to apply to what has to happen at the state level and we have sort of perfect timing right now with right. what we're as engaged the, as the state in. is rethinking and is in a position to really push some fundamental structures that the lessons is, is timely. Okay. Absolutely. Point taken. All right. Heather Anakini. She's far too dignified. <clears throat> so, uh, I want to build off that for a second, Ginger. I think it can be super tempting from a policy perspective to take what works at Greg's school or take what works at Barton's school and then say everyone in the state should do exactly what Greg does or exactly what Barton does and make that the policy. And I want us to think about here in Chicago but also statewide what got us here, which is that change happens in schools and that change looks different in Greg's school than it does in Barton's school. And the policy construct that we build in the city or statewide has to really bet on the ability of great teachers and leaders in those schools to implement what's right for their kids. If we take what's good about Chicago and try to scale that to 800 districts across the state of Illinois, we will absolutely fail if the focus is not at the school level. So what I'm hearing you say, make sure that I've got this right, is you don't want cookie cutter programmatic prescriptions. What you want is to learn lessons about the conditions, the dynamics, the processes, and the interactions um, that allowed good things to happen at scale here. Yeah, and policy either enables that kind of differentiated approach at the school level, or it gets in the way. And Chicago's done a lot of great work at figuring out how to get out of the way of amazing educators. We gotta think about how to translate that. Yeah, no, we, 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 I think humans have a bad tendency to sometimes learn the, and apply the wrong lessons. Sarah, did you want to follow up? And, was I missing, and, then over to, and then over here. I wanted to quickly follow up and build off on a lot of things that were said um, at the school level. What, one of the changes we've really seen is teams of teachers tackling problems. And the biggest policy barrier to that is not having any time in which teachers can meet with one another. Um, so that to me is the easiest, um, most obvious. I mean, basic funding would be nice. I was gonna say that's a money issue. <laughs> well, basic funding would be nice, and then teachers actually need time to collaborate because it doesn't. Teachers, none of us improves on our own without feedback and without conversation, and that is a little bit in response to you. I think the difference in that we see in principals now than maybe we saw. 15 years ago is the distributive leadership and the, and the placing the data and the questions in the hands of teacher teams. Yeah, the, the, and that's a very complex, you know, what is it that you can do within the current constraints and where, where do we really need to fundamentally reimagine and where are dollars gonna come in on that? That's a big, 
that's a big, big topic. Sorry, I said we were going to go over here, and then we're going to come back here to the right. We're going to make them move. See how we're making them work off their lunch? Hi, <laughs> what um, you get for not listening to me earlier. I'm uh, Amy Rasmussen with CAPE Chicago Arts Partnerships, and we heard a lot in the first half about the role of professional development at the school level that helped schools get better. I think that we had to look at our policies around that and as a district, how can we support what you were just talking about, localized schools coming together through professional development, through teacher collaboration, um, and frankly talk about what professional development hasn't been so successful. We've all seen useless teacher workshops happen that have no impact. So think about what we are doing and what we um, should stop doing. So we can concentrate that time and scarce dollars, et cetera, where it, where it really works. All right, I'm going to try and take only one or two more on policy so we have time to talk about some of the research questions that, are, uh, that follow necessarily. I don't have a teacher. Oh, there it is. Um, <laughs> Doug, Doug Scott with A Better Chicago. I just, as we talk about funding and, and the money being more equitably, equitably distributed, it's been such a painful time for districts, and they've had to make some really painful cuts. It'd be exciting to see as the money comes back, how is that thought about in a different way than it has been in the past? I'm sure there will be some districts in the state where it goes right back to where it was, and others who will use the opportunity to say, what are the things we do need in different schools and different buildings and different classrooms, whether it's teacher time or professional development, to really use it well? And it'd be great if the state could sort of at least put out some sort of thought around that, not a prescription, but just an ask to say, can you tell us where it's going? Because I think once we start to see that, one, we can learn from it, and two, it'll encourage more people to put even more funding as they see great decision making happening at the, uh, the state and district level with that new money coming back. These are an important moment. Okay, one last one, Paul. So one point that I think has come out of the work that, that we've done that um, has important policy implications is that and, and runs contrary to where most federal policy has been, including ESSA, is that raising achievement from the data we're looking at is not fundamentally a supplemental or remedial problem. That is to say, we see no district, uh, no school, no uh, region in this state, and I'm um, thinking uh, nationally, that where achievement from Sean's data, that where we are not seeing achievement at all levels rising at the same time. That is to say, we do not see at any of those levels, achievement rising among the lowest level of achievers, but nothing happening at the top of the achievement distribution. That's a really important policy implication, I think, because what it tells us is that the, the tenets of the Common Core are important for all students, most particularly our lowest achieving students, that you do not raise achievement for lowest achieving students unless you're designing a program that, of course, provides supplemental and remedial supports, but focuses most intentionally on the work that's going on in the general program of instruction, a la Common Core, to raise the bar for all students. No, and given the converse, where the conversation is right now, that's actually a big deal for people to keep that in mind. I also don't want to lose, you had, you had made a policy recommendation earlier on the K-8, the value. Chicago public school parent with K-8, there is, you know, I don't want to lose that, that that was said earlier, um, that not having that shifts moving from grade levels um, can really help consolidate and uh, learning and prevent disruption. Did I get that right? Y you did. Uh, just one other, while well, I've got the microphone in my hand, I can't help here. Uh oh, I want uh -oh. to jump on, uh, you know, um, something that... Um, 30 seconds. Was, uh, it'll be no less. It'll be no more. That is that there is, there is, speaking of changing the narrative, there is a misnomer out there that declining achievement downstate is really just small rural districts. That's not the case. We are, one thing that has happened during the low, No Child Left Behind era is that for the first time, really, we're seeing concentrations of white poverty downstate that we never saw before. And what we're seeing from that is that, equ is that economic disruption is an equal opportunity disruptor. That is to say, we're seeing s scores in, in district, not just small districts, Bloomington, Quincy, Champaign, Urbana, uh, Springfield, that is at or below what Chicago is doing right now, and that is with much lower uh, low income rates. What and, I love and, about and this, largely Paul, white population. is that you are actually segueing us beautifully into what are the additional research questions that we have that follow naturally from we've learned so much, but there's still much more that we, we should want to know. Of course, Peter has brilliantly captured and remembered my point about early childhood and the role that that may or may not be playing. Who else has something really, um, some research questions they think follow naturally from this conversation? 
Chuck will move to you next. He can just pass it right down to you. I'm Barton Dassinger, Chavez Elementary School. I was really interested, Paul, in what you had to say about middle school and the impact of transitions. It seems like academic centers and CPS are growing where students are moving uh, out of sixth grade elementary into a seventh grade high school. So I'd be really curious to see um, research on those middle school students, especially as they grow more and expand more so we make those decisions under research. Yeah, in other words, we can test that, okay. Chuck? Uh, I'm Chuck Lewis, I'm Penny Seberg's husband. Uh, <laughs> 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 right? Um, <laughs> It's <laughs> the way I'm known, so I might as well admit it. <laughs> the, um, um, I think there's very important research that's been done by Steve Radenbush and Lisa, Lisa Rosen. Um, and building on what, what Sarah had talked about earlier, that is the importance of time in school buildings for teachers to collaborate. So I uh, commend their book to you, The Ambitious Elementary School, uh, and I get a commission on this. Okay, so not new research, but paying more attention to the existing one now. Some new research questions. How appropriate do we, if we, we've got Jenny, and then there was somebody here. Who did I miss? Okay, we'll come to you next. Hi, um, Jenny Nagoka from the Consortium on School Research. So I might be being a little um, self-interested here because it's also my you research mean Jenny interest. from the Consortium on Chicago School Research? I'm sure you're not. Go ahead. <laughs> so, um, but I think you know, we've seen a tremendous amount of progress in the district and we're sending, we're getting more kids through high school and we're sending them on to college. But I think one of the big questions is what happens to them next and really understanding what sort of pathways there are into higher education, into the workforce. How can we actually be making sure that the improvements that we see in the district here in K-12 are not lost when they go on to higher ed. So I think there's a lot of work that we need to do in higher ed, um, probably particularly in the city colleges since they're such an important part of the ecosystem in this city. Okay, a lot in there. Uh, yeah, over here and then we'll come to these gentlemen. Hi, I'm Paula Barajas. I'm a uh, K through two and eighth grade educator at Lozano Bilingual. And I guess my research question would be for researchers around teacher teams. So we've talked a lot about how teachers can learn from each other. I would be interested, so I am currently at a school that's moved from a level two to a one plus in the last five years. We've made that movement. I would love to see what a, a team of my teachers going to a school that was where we were at and sort of working with them, how does that work? And then also learning from a school that is where we're going so that we don't become stagnant. So I think that would be a great thing for researchers to kind of look at. All right, we're gonna be down here and then over to Larry. Thank you. Listening to the presentation this morning, I was really struck that a lot of the trends in Chicago uh, are similar actually in Washington, D.C. Uh, a district that started with very poor performance and has made rapid gains in recent years. Uh, people are also trying to sort out why and how. And I'm just wondering if there might be some opportunities to think beyond Chicago, to think about a collection of uh, large school districts where we see different trends of this type, uh, perhaps using Sean's data, uh, perhaps using Ray Hart's knowledge of uh, different districts and practices being implemented to get further uh, in an exploratory way to try to un untangle what might, be behind, what might be behind some of these gains. Okay, intriguing. And Larry? This might, this might, Larry Stanton um, was with CPS and now do consulting. Um, this is going back to Peter's point about communications, but I think it would actually be worth doing some research on how to tell this story to your various stakeholders. I mean, I've got a sister who's a first grade teacher. If, she, if I went and told her about this, she'd say, eh, I don't believe it. I mean, there's just such deep cynicism both within the system and just in the general population that this is a significant story to try to tell and I think getting some help on how to do it. Sending out memos and uh, the, the ordinary storytelling isn't going to work and I just think it's got to be worked on. Okay. Yeah. And then Penny, did you have your hand up? You'll be next. Uh, I'm Colin Baker with A Better Chicago. Um, I think one thing that has struck me throughout the day and then also I'm um, a former teacher, as my time as a teacher um, was something that um, 
Principal Jones actually brought up was um, the role of um, not just college counselors, but also um, social workers and social counselors in schools. And I think, um, you know, I was originally going to make this comment as a policy question, but I think, you know, when I think about it, when I talk about it with people, it's kind of like a, well, there's really no good way to measure the impact of social work on academic performance. <laughs> Um, because there's so many external factors, it's really hard to eliminate um, ambiguity and in in, to, to research that. Um, I think that's a huge question for the academic community to raise and to tackle. How do we look at the role of social workers in schools to not just boost academic performance, but life outcomes of students? Um, and I think looking at that and trying to figure out some solid answers to inform policy around social workers in schools, um, not just pure numbers, but what kind of training um, so I'll wrap up there, but I think the role of social workers in schools um, and social work and social, social emotional learning and teaching is hugely important and there's a huge opportunity for research there. All right, I appreciate that. Penny, I think you're going to get the last one because we're at time for some closing remarks. Don't hurt yourself. On the uh, comment of, from, about Washington, D.C., uh, we do have a, an opportunity to uh, do some collaborative uh, research with other cities. So after we started the consortium here in Chicago, uh, 15 or 20 other cities now have uh, comparable uh, or almost comparable um, uh, research groups. So there would be an opportunity, I think, to, to look at this more globally. All right, I think we're at time. I'm gonna end by saying one comment that was clearly a thread throughout all of this and bears mentioning, which is the use of data and research. You heard CPS, it's got an unusual relationship with the consortium and thinking about how do you take that and build that muscle across the state and make that more available to more districts, I think is, a, is another implication of, of what we've heard. Thanks everybody, and John, over to you. Uh, Mr. Claypool, would you uh, be willing to come up and say a few words? <clears throat> thank you. I mostly just want to thank everyone um, for today, uh, uh, but also for the work that you've done uh, for many years. It was, as, as has been a theme here today, obviously the, the uh, research, the data, the academic institution support, the civic support has driven so much of the reforms and changes that have, that have resulted in, in, these, uh, in these gains. Um, I know that the one question that was uh, posed earlier that Janice addressed um, was how could these gains in the last two years have continued to rise given the extraordinary fa financial crisis that we were under. Um, and um, I, I, there was a, um, well first, first of all let me say that I, I want to thank Robin Staines and Ginger and others who were involved in the fight in Springfield along with our parents, our, the minister, our leading clergy and others. Um, who fought tooth and nail um, in the last two years to, uh, to win funding reform. And uh, so hopefully now with, with that stability, um, you know, our teachers, for example, will be in the spring able to actually, for the first time in years, put out offers at the same time suburban schools do so we can get better teachers. Um, Hopefully that means that some of our uh, great principals will not be as tempted to go to greener pastures. Uh, similarly, our great teachers, um, parents uh, who, who uh, you know, might uh, be concerned about uh, the future uh, can now, I think, be um, confident that their children will be in good hands for the coming year. So all those things, I think, will allow us to uh, cement these gains and hopefully we can keep the next two years going. And um, you know, as Janice indicated earlier, um, while uh, while I and my team were in the bottom of the boat trying to plug the leaking holes uh, so that it didn't sink, she was maintaining the sails at the top of the boat to keep the educational gains moving forward. So uh, it, it was remarkable, though, um, that this happened. And I think it did happen for another reason that, that, that so many people in this room, including uh, Heather and others, uh, ha have, have focused on, um, which is leadership. And, and I, the only one point I want to make on that is I was... I was uh, um, Heather had a, a um, uh, principal forum uh, recently, and I was talking to one of the principals who had gone to a professional training, a year-long professional training program at Columbia University. 
And she said, you know, the first two, she, she said it was fantastic. And she said, the first two weeks we spent at the Gettysburg battlefield. And I said, what? She said, that was my first reaction too. We spent the first two weeks of a year long professional training at Gettysburg. And she said, she thought that was crazy, but by the end she was, thought it was absolutely brilliant and fantastic. And she said the one lesson from it, from that battle, which they inculcated in those two weeks, was that leadership must be diffused. Leadership must be diffused throughout the organization. You know, General, once the, once the chaos started and the bullets started flying, uh, General Meade didn't have control of the battlefield. Um, and because there were strong leaders that had been developed and diffused throughout the organization, uh, they won a victory anyway that turned, turned the war. And I think the last couple of years when the bullets were flying and we were hunkered down and we were trying to survive uh, with a racially unjust system that gave our kids a fraction of what other kids in the rest of the predominantly white state received, uh, when we had you know, people trying to essentially bankrupt our, our system, um, that diffused leadership, I think, came through. They, they continued to do what they have been doing, and that is to train great teachers, um, make sure their students are uh, monitoring the data, as, you, as you've helped help provide, so that our students get the interventions they need, and continued step by step by step to continue to move the needle on academic progress. So I think we have a lot of lessons, that we, many of which have been talked about today, that we have to keep going, uh, but hopefully we'll have more stability that will make that environment richer uh, to take it to the next level. So again, I want to thank uh, the Joyce Foundation and others for this, this tremendous opportunity. Uh, Peter, and your work and, um, and everyone who's part of this. So it's exciting, it was exciting to be here today. Uh, we're proud of what's happened, but we also look forward to the, a lot of work to come. So thank you. Uh, thanks very much, Forrest. Uh, before we conclude, I just want, we, um, I introduced Tom Brock, who came to us from Washington, D.C., the Institute of Education Sciences. But I want to also acknowledge a couple of guests who came to us from St. Louis, including the superintendent of schools. And we hope you found uh, this helpful. Uh, I just want to say thank you to everyone here, to uh, all the presenters, all the participants. I think we probably heard from 90% of the people in the room. A common theme in remarks today was this idea of the ecosystem and the community. And it's this community and ecosystem that's going to sustain, maintain, and grow these improvements. So thank you to all of you.